Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. Shipping and everything like that is difficult, so okay. put my bandana on. Okay. NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 2nd, 1988. The Are you sick? A little bit. Mm. Yeah, I sound a little funny. Uh, April 2nd, 1988, the Clash of the Champions Aftermath show. The Fallout show. It sounds like you're dead. It sounds like you just smoked about a pack. <laughs> yeah, like there's very little life left in your body. <laughs> I feel <laughs> feel mostly fine. I might okay. cough a little bit. So you're over it. Yeah, it's, it's a little throat tickle. Was all. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. yes, I, I, I acknowledge I sound like a different human being today. Mm. Should sing some blues. Yeah. Okay. Show opened with a clip of Dusty Rhodes' heinous baseball uh, baseball bat attack from last week on Tully Blanchard. One thing about these NWA shows, they are very good at moving on. They build the shows, they do the big shows, and then it's on, on to the next show. And they just... What's happening to the buttons? I'm just trying to help you a little bit. I see. Trying to get the gravel out of my voice? I think that might help a little. No. Go ahead. So J.J. Dillon joins the announcers. Says the NWA has been holding meetings all week to determine how to handle the Dusty Road situation, but he is upset. Nobody has agreed to meet him one on one to hear him out. He promises something harsh will happen to Dusty, and he'll be back later in the show to show the video again. Yeah, did you watch UFC? I heard there was a to do. Jesus Christ. Can you imagine this? Yet another one. The irony. Oh, the coincidence? That we just happen to be on the week the day after this UFC. Where JJ's out here saying people are trying to bend over backwards for Dusty Rhodes. The NWA can't close their eyes to this. They've got to do something about this man. There must be awfully harsh pun punishments befalling the American dream, Dusty Rhodes. It's like, didn't I just rant about this for 30 fucking minutes on the show last night with Connor and Khabib? And now here's JJ Dillon cutting the promo for me about Dusty Rhodes. Pretty sure what Khabib and his crew did was actually worse than Dusty Rhodes attacking man with a baseball bat. No, not really. <laughs> They're both bad. Yeah, no one got hurt last night. Well, I guess that's the true. The president of the end, like, Jim Crockett Jr. We don't even know what condition he's in. He has not been seen. He was assaulted with a baseball bat. That is true. That's a fact. It's very, very serious. Fantastics versus Alan Martin and Keith Steinborn. They did a bunch of cool double teams. It went longer than it needed to. So they're going for a big m double missile drop kick, and the timing was off. And instead of two drop kicks hitting at once, it appeared Fulton saved the guy by drop, ki drop kicking him out of Tommy Rogers' way. Yeah, they tried to do. They tried to steal a move from Filthy and I, the double chop. But they were going to do a drop kick. Mm -hmm. But the the problem they had, and I'm going to explain this to the Fantastics. You understand? Okay. Okay. If you're going to both come off the top and hit somebody, you've got to come out of opposite corners. You understand what I'm saying? I do. That way, when you're coming out of the opposite corners, when one guy hits, if the guy takes the bump, he goes towards the direction of the other guy coming out of the corner. So even if the time is a little off. Yeah. yeah. These two fucking idiots, the guy's in the middle, and they both came off the corners on the same side of the ring. So one guy hit the guy first, and he goes flying, but he goes flying the opposite direction of where he needs to be. Yes. And so the other guy crashed and burned. This was ridiculous. So they hit the rocket launcher for the win, and then they cut a promo. So this is after the wild brawl at the Clash with the Midnight Express. They said the Midnights could not out-wrestle them, so they attacked them with chairs, furniture, anything they could grab. Bobby Fulton talks about getting whipped and how it upset his mom's neighbors. <laughs> what? That's what he said. His my mom's mo neighbors? My mother's neighbors were very upset about watching me take the, that whipping. Promised they were going to do the same to Cornette. Pull down his pants, show his flowered panties or whatever he was wearing, giving give him the whipping he needed. And Roger says, you know, I woke up in that hospital with my nose pushed across my face. My eye pushed back into my skull, but that didn't hurt as bad as watching my partner take that whipping. So six days ago, you suffered major facial injuries. You put a Band-Aid on your nose and you're right here on national TV fighting again. It's tough. It is tough. He's a very tough man. Sting versus Big Bear Collie. Right, I got a serious question for all of the historians out there. Are we certain that Big Bear Collie is not Scott Norton? If there's like a, a young, a, clumsy Scott Norton. Very clumsy. Yeah, he was horrible. Uh, uh, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't bump. He couldn't hit the ropes. He couldn't do anything. But he looked 
like a giant powerhouse. He looked like a wrestler. With he Scott, looked like Scott Norton. With Scott Norton's hair. Yeah. Now the first and body. Largely, yeah. The the first twenty seconds of, seconds of this were so horrible. It just about undid everything. Flared in forty five minutes of the clash. As far as making Sting a star, fortunately he is Sting and he recovered. Hit the splash and the scorpion for the win. Then he cut a promo after the break, and he was by Sting nineteen eighty eight standards out of his mind. Yeah, he was on another planet. He was incredible. He's got Flair's number. Going to take him to forty five, maybe sixty minutes at the Omni. Talks about the Twin Towers title win, how great that is. Talks about St. Martin, where there's a show coming up. How, how do you, the island? Could be, I, I guess. So it's going to be great having St. Martin standing behind him. St. Martin? <laughs> or St. <Satan> Martin, whichever. <laughs> as much as Sting was talking here, I couldn't tell. Says Dusty had handled Tully just as he would have. And he says, woo! And he tells David, I'll talk to you later. This guy who had so much energy and charisma yes. here, and the fans went so crazy for him, that one week ago I said, going into the Flair match, you thought it would be too early for him to be the champion. Mm-hmm. Coming out of the Flair match, you thought, you know what, this man could be the champion at any time. That, that, that's how much that match did for him. After this promo, I was like, why didn't they just make him the champion? <laughs> Like, even for six months or eight months or something like that. Like, what the fuck difference would it make? He was so popular. The people absolutely loved him. Mm -hmm. He could do no wrong. He certainly wasn't horrible. No. I mean, I don't know. He was great here. He was a megastar. Yes. They re-air the finish of the Twin Towers Horseman match from The Clash, and then the Towers hit the studio to celebrate... Six days later, it uh, they, they've cleaned up and taken a shower, but otherwise it's like they just won the title five minutes ago. Lex is doing a lap around the ring, slapping everyone's hands. Barry's talking about how hard it was to beat a team like Tilly and Arn, and then Lex comes over to talk, and Sting was a super-duper star, but Lex was a superstar here. He was awesome. Says he's gloating. He had proven there was life after the Horseman. Told the Horseman, I told you so. Now the Crockett Cup's coming. Forget who the top seeds are. Barry and I are the World Tag Team Champions. We are the favorites. He says Barry had a heart the size of Lake Michigan, was man enough to forgive him. He's going nuts. And then Wyndham has to kill the mood. Talk about Dusty and Magnum and how sad the whole situation is. And he finishes and he starts to leave, but Lex has to talk more. And Barry stops and rolls his eyes a few times, like multiple revolutions around the room. And I don't know if that was planned or just a natural reaction to Lex taking the mic one more time, but either way, it is a thing of beauty where this is going. Luger was so happy. He was so excited. There's life after the horseman. It was a long time coming. Hate to say I told you so. It was so incredible. This was the most important thing in Lex Luger's life, to win this title with Barry Windham. Mm-hmm. That's what you need if you're going to have championships in pro wrestling. That matter. It's got to be the most important thing in the lives of the people that hold the belts. If it's anything less than that, then you may as well not have belts. And I've never seen Luger so happy. And keep in mind, he was the U.S. champion for a while. But I guess he for was a months. Heel. Yeah. Here he is. He's getting mushy. I offered my hand to Barry. He didn't have to take it. But he did. Yeah. I'm so proud and thankful for him being a good friend and a great partner. Now we're champions. This was like... The most wonderful promo. Everyone who wins a title should watch this promo. So, you know they didn't do? Well, I guess they're not heels, but they didn't come out and pretend like they were going to cry and then say, you know, like every WWE heel win, oh, we're going to act like we're all humble, but then we're just faking it, that sort of thing. So, I loved it. They were very happy because winning championships is awesome. Ric Flair promo. Okay, when was Viagra invented? Oh, man, it was not until, like, uh, it was 98-ish, I believe. Because we remember, about it on Nitro every there was that and, Nitro, and, and, and everybody was talking about Viagra for weeks on Nitro. Well, apparently Ric Flair got his hands on a Orlando Jordan's time machine, got himself some Viagra, because that was the whole point of this promo. He takes out two bottles of pills, says, these are the vitamins I've been taking. These got me through all night with five women. I was up all night with five women, flew across the country, and I still took Sting to a draw. He then begins to pop pills on live TV. They were in his mouth for like the entire promo, like he was chewing them. 
which I don't believe he's supposed to do with pills, but I'm going to tell Ric Flair how to Maybe do it. Maybe this is that shit that John Jones took that got him popped. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or Anderson Silva. Yeah, somebody, somebody shipped this promo to USADA so they can test him. Uh, let's see. He was worried that Dusty Rhodes would get them thrown off the air. By the way, this gimmick was called Power Formula Number 1 and Power Formula Number 2. Uh-huh. It led to him staying up all night with five women. I got to Google this. <laughs> so he likes the idiots who are watching the show to have to put up with him. That's why he doesn't want to get thrown off the air. So Steve Williams at The Clash had called him out. Warned Steve not to do this, and they just kept talking about vitamins and women and vitamins. Said, here, David, you need some vitamins, too, and gave him some. And that was it. Hold on. I got more to say, but I got to Google this. Power formula number one. Nothing. He might have made that up. Maybe I should do the number one instead of uh, spelling it out. Power formula one. Nothing. Just a bunch of Formula One stuff. I wonder. Anyway, so an update from last week's show. He was talking about one idiot judge ruled it a draw. Their match. Right. He says there were two geniuses and one idiot. So, two geniuses and one idiot. I think he assumed... It should have just been one. I think the idiot was the guy who voted for Sting. In, his, in, in Flair's mind. So the genius had ruled it a draw. Because he's happy with the draw. Okay, well, the, the idiot's the guy that ruled it a draw. Because the rules were, there must be a winner. I recall. And that's why the fucking judges are there, in case it goes to a draw. You don't rule it a draw, you moron. you got to pick one guy or the other. Not to mention, if you watch the match, it's clear who the winner should have been. Sting. It's not like it was a close fight. No. So anyway. This was a 10-8 fight. In a, in a update, apparently the gimmick was... That Sting got to choose one judge. Flair got to choose another judge, which is how the penthouse pet got in there. Yeah. It wasn't like the NWA just decided, let's put this hot girl in there as the judge. That was Flair's pick, obviously. And then I guess the NWA chose the third. So it's the NWA's fault. They're the idiots here. They chose a guy and didn't explain to him, there must be a winner. That too. Don't rule it a draw. Frankly, it's also stupid to let the combatants pick the judges. It, well, yeah, that's dumb, too. <laughs> it's a very dumb company. <laughs> yeah. And then he went off and on about Dusty and him and JJ are just grinning over their pill bottles. <laughs> David's in hysterics as Flair gives him an entire bottle. This was great. Sheep Herders versus Rocky King and Larry Stevens. It was short. The Sheep Herders won with the battering ram and the gut buster. Said the Sheep Herders claim they'd held tag titles in 37 different countries. That was their claim. I'm skeptical. They have been around for quite a while at this point. Yes. Not impossible. No, it is. Okay. So they plug the Crockett Cup. Say they're going to win. Send the Crockett Cup back to New Zealand. It's an offensive mind tournament, JR reminded us. I no. should ask him what that means next time I'm doing a show. What is an, off- what is an offensive minded tournament? I, 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 frankly, I get offensive. I want to know what the opposite would be. What is a defensive minded tournament? Hmm. Maybe if you get a buy, oh, that doesn't make sense either. I don't know. Every so, tournament's offensive-minded, that, Vinny. That's how it seems to me, yeah. Yes. Johnny Ace and his Midnight Rocker sunglasses are behind him, and they promise to send the Crockett Cup back to New Zealand and also beat Wyndham and Luger for the tag belts. Being a sheep herder looks like fun. I'll say. Arn Anderson versus Art Pritz. Arn beats him, torches him, wins with a spine buster. A bad one. He didn't even twist with it. No, he just lifted him up and fell on the guy. <laughs> it's like, that sucked, and then he pinned him. Yeah. So he goes to do a promo, and David Crockett openly taunts Arn. What a jerk. What are you so mad about, Arn? Did you have to lose the tag titles to get mad? What's wrong? Like, he's trying to pick a fight. Well. With Arn yes, Anderson. That's David Crockett. So Arn says, this is not anger, this is intensity. So a week before, he had taken a beautiful woman to Hawaii, trained all week, lied on the beach, Thought about how many people would and what they would give to be in his shoes right then. And then he gets home, and the day before the biggest match of his career, his uh, his answering machine, he had another word for it, a very dated reference, but so it was loaded with messages from J.J. and Tully and all his friends talking about Dusty Rhodes attacking people with a baseball bat on live TV. And what he really hated 
about all this was all those kids and senior citizens who looked up to Dusty to do the right thing. Like Dusty had let him down. Yeah. It's a terrible thing to do. It is. Can't go after the president of the National Wrestling... Actually, he's not the president of the NWA, but the president of Crockett Promotions or whatever. Yes, yes. Can't hit him with a bat. Really shouldn't. <laughs> no, that's not right. No. It's a bad role model. He congratulated Luger and Wyndham for being just a little bit better than them for three seconds, but said they have been the better team for 365 days. Warn the towers, do not turn your backs on the four horsemen. Road Warriors versus Joe Cruz and El Negro. Since there's nothing to talk about in this match, okay. they announced that the Road Warriors will be on WCW main event tomorrow at 535 Eastern. So, this show starts at 6.05. Main event starts at 5.35. And if you remember, on TBS, everything started at five minutes past the top and bottom of the hour. Mm -hmm. Anybody know why? I don't. Well, Ted Turner's crazy. Well, there's that. And he, he created this Turner time. Oh, God. <laughs> which is basically, the, the theory that he had was that it wasn't about when it started. It was about when it ended. So if you watched Mayberry, the Andy Griffith show, and the show went off the air at 4.35, if you were thinking about turning the channel, all the other shows were already five minutes in. So you may as well just keep watching TBS. <laughs> Swear to God. Okay. That was his theory. And so he kept it 6.35 all those years. 8.05. 6.05 Eastern. All nine yards. So the Warriors won, as you may have guessed. Uh, who sounded worse, me on this show or Animal Through His Mask? You. Okay. No, no, he did. Okay. You sounded better. Yes. I couldn't understand a word he said. Which is funny, because he's done promos in it before. I couldn't understand those either. Well, I guess not. But he tears it off and says, I don't need this anymore. I'm 100%. Thank God. And they promised to win the Crockett Cup. Hawk said, we're seating ourselves number one. Said so nobody wanted to face him in the tournament, because they know they wouldn't make it any rounds past them. Which is probably true. Ron Garvin and Gorgeous Jimmy versus Ryan Wagner and Steve Atkinson. Dude, I hope my match with Marco Stunt is half as awesome as his violent <laughs> beating. They beat the shit out of these two guys. Mostly Ronnie. Oh, it was great. Ronnie is in there with Wagner. Wagner, like many of these jobbers, is skinny fat and not wearing nearly enough clothing. So Ronnie locks him in an abdominal stretch. So he's got his left arm hooked over the dude's right arm. He's bending him over, and he looks down at the man's flabby body. And he takes his right hand and just does, like, a tit claw. He hey. just grabs his boob and squeezes. And I thought at first I was imagining things or that I had just like been a, a, hadn't lasted as long as I did. Then I realized, no, there are still fingerprint, you know, red finger marks on the man's boob. Yeah. It's brutal. <laughs> just, just a titty twister. Atkinson tags in. He's much skinnier. And so Garvin does this... Delayed German suplex. <laughs> so awesome. He grabs him around the waist. He just lifts him up. And I don't know if he called it or if Atkinson figured out what to do. But Atkinson almost looks like a baby on his back. Just uh, <laughs> waving his arms with no point and his legs going back and forth. And then Garvin just threw him backwards. There's all head. sorts of guys that do this spot nowadays. But this was Jimmy or Ronnie Garvin doing it in 1988. Yes. God, it was awesome. Yes. So, finally, Jimmy tagged in almost for the first time and just does this amazing brain buster. We yep. all screamed, and then they did a slow-mo replay that showed it was a worked brain buster, but still looked yes. awesome. I've, I've mentioned this many times, but uh, if Jimmy Garvin could only work, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, good. Like... He was, he, was, he was okay. He was below average. He did have one of the greatest brain busters in history of wrestling. I will give him that. Kind of up and down. Some, some weeks better than others. This was a great one. Yeah, but his work was like, eh, it's all right. Yeah, yes. And then later, Al Perez shows up. And I thought, if that fucking guy could talk like Jimmy Garvin. You know what I mean? I'm just amalgamating all these wrestlers. If, if thinking you... about the millions of dollars, the multi-millions these people could have made. If Jimmy Garvin could just work. He was such a great promo. His promo here. This promo was unbelievably great. Th this should have been legendary. 
Yeah. This should be a, a, a classic promo. The problem promo. was on a show with Flair and all these other guys that are blow away. This would have been the best promo of the year in 2018. When this show was done, I will skip ahead a little bit. When this show ended, all I could think of was the best things on the show were Jimmy Garvin and Kevin Sullivan cutting promos on each other. I had forgotten about Sting and Flair at the time. Now, we went back over this. Sting and Flair were great, too. Cornette was great, too. But Kevin is great later, and Garvin was so awesome here. Garvin says, Ronnie runs his mouth. Ronnie and Sting are apparently a team in the Crockett Cup. What a team that is. Ronnie, Garvin, and Sting. Yes. Dude. They have the same haircut in Sting common. Sting should just be his own it. partner. I would be fine with he that. He has enough energy for five men. Yes. He could be his own Survivor Series team here in 1988. So Jimmy's running down Kevin in the Govarsity Club. He says he sometimes you fight for titles, fight for money, fight for fame. I've won championships. I've held championship gold. I've ridden in jets. I've flown some jets. I've ridden in limousines. True. That was, his, that was his later in life job. And he was a pilot. I've ridden in limousines. I've had the best food. I've, food. I've had the best wine. I've toured the world. And none of it means nothing. Nothing is compared to Precious. He turns to his wife and says, I love you very much. And they share a sweet kiss. He turns back to the camera and says, I don't care if a man's balding. I don't care if his woman's 5,000 pounds. If you love a woman, you love her, and you will do anything for her. He turns to Precious. Precious, I love you. I'll do anything for you. This was so fantastic. So out of this world great. And Ron Garvin is so touched. <laughs> he grabs David Crockett and chokes the shit out of him and smiles. <laughs> That's how Ronnie Garvin shows love. Yes. He throws he his, was he was he throws his stricken. forearm bone into the man's throat. Yes. I love you, David. I'm going to choke your neck off. Yes. So yeah, we know what Jimmy's fighting for and how important it is to him now. There's no question about that. And how he he made his like upper mid card program. I'm more excited about the Prince of Darkness death in that match now. Oh hell yeah! Than the world championship, absolutely any world championship program or the Crockett Cup, just because of this promo. Well, and the Sullivan promo at the end, which was astounding. Also true. Al Perez and Mike Jackson, sloppy and short. God, Al Perez looks so much He's, like Seth Rollins, but he works so much like he does like Seth. I was actually thinking it looks like Roman, but he looks more like Seth. He looks exactly like Seth. Yes, it's, it's astounding. He's not Seth. No. He's a. He works like one of the like Armstrongs. Kinda. It's not a. He he, he works actually. He works like Jimmy Garvin. He's not, no not bad. No, no. He's got a basic generic arm hold, arm bar, technical wrestling, boring ass style. I see. I'm saying that's someone who does that, by the way. Yeah. But it's boring as shit here. <laughs> I try to make it somewhat exciting. This was boring. So he wins with a spinning toe hold. And they cut a promo, and when it starts off, everything's going fine. Gary Hart, to stand out from this crew of maniacs and screamers, he is calmly and rationally explaining how Larry Zabisco and Al Perez complement each other very well. Another stunning team. Larry Zabisco and Al Perez. What? Like, everyone, everyone's in this tournament. Man. They're bad guys. I guess. <laughs> they both have Zs in their name. Yes. The Z to Z Express. Yes. So it's a bizrez. It's a bizrez. Perezco. Perezabisco. Perezco. Perez. Okay. That's two. Larry has two Z's. That Perezco. Is yeah. Perezco is better. Uh. Anyway. So this is all going fine. And then Gary says, "Now we have been promised a U.S. title shot, and now they're telling us we must face Nikita Koloff first. And then suddenly everyone starts talking at the same time. Gary is trying to complain about having to face Nikita Koloff first. David is making fun of Gary for being scared of having to face Nikita Koloff. Al is insisting he's not afraid of Nikita Koloff, and they're all just going over and over and over. All I know was very irritating, and David needed an ass-kicking on the show. JJ returned. He reminded everyone that Jim Crockett Jr. had been struck in the ribs. He says, Flair is defending the title in St. Martin on Monday. The NWA is holding a meeting on Tuesday. I will stay over. I will be there to be the conscience of the board of directors and make sure that justice prevails. They replay the baseball bat attack and then Tully Blanchard does a promo. <laughs> he admits watching himself get attacked with a baseball bat is hard to watch. Says Dusty has always been the master of the psych out, always was in everyone's head, always had the fight won before they ever got in the ring, but now he's made the big mistake he's never made in his career. 
And I'm trying to think. I, I know like what the mistake is, and I'm trying to think how he's going to frame this. Like he, he lost control, or he he ex- he revealed to the world what a terrible person he really was, and instead, Tully just says factually, he attacked someone with a weapon on live TV. That is the mistake Dusty had never made in his career. That is true. So it was not in the ring. It was not any match. It was just ringside. He's made a huge mistake, and now he promises JJ's money is going to ensure. Think about all the times a horseman attacked somebody and it wasn't in the ring. The car door. With a weapon. <laughs> Rubbing Ricky Morton's face in the mat. Uh, but you know, those guys deserved it. Yeah. Jim Crockett did not deserve this. The four horsemen. Dusty is a criminal. In two cars, <laughs> tailed Dusty yes. Rhodes into a parking lot and slammed his head into a car door. But this is different. <laughs> this is different. This is different. Dusty deserved that. What's the line at the time? This is the only language Dusty understands. Dusty forced us to do this. Yes. Yes. My favorite line is he says, we've been trying to put you out physically for years. He actually admits. Yeah. We've been trying to put you out physically for years, but now we're going to do the smart way. It's like Al Capone, he says. They didn't get him, quote, for killing people and stuff. (laughs) They got him on tax evasion. Yes. And they said, you know, part of us, part of us wants to let Dusty off the hook and finish him off in the ring once and for all, but... Then they go to the Al Capone analogy and say they're gonna they're gonna get Dusty for the equivalent of tax evasion, which is attacking a man with a baseball bat on live TV. They promise they will get Dusty suspended for life this time. It was just my favorite JJ painfully overconfident that we have seen the last of Dusty Rhodes. I love JJ. He's the best. He's the absolute best. He's amazing. Like Cornette is an astounding talker. He's such a great talker, but J.J. is actually a better character. Cornette's a cartoon. Yes. J.J. is just a little bit exaggerated human. Yes, he, actually. He, he, he has one, one foot in reality. Yeah, Cornette, Cornette is somebody that you'd see on Saturday morning animated. Yeah, yeah. And J.J. is the boss you hate. Yes, that's he a very good analogy. He justifies every way that you get fucked over as an employee. Yes. And he's so greedy, and he's such a dick. And it's always something you bring on yourself. It's your fault. Yes. And he's so excited all the time about being able to fuck you. He's the insurance guy who denies your claim. Yes. He's just, he's just a, 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 a real-life asshole. Midnight Express versus Tony Super and Trent. Oh, I skip ahead here. Uh, Cornette comes out. He brags about how bad the Fantastics had gotten beat, how Fulton had gotten whipped. He does a great line where he's mocking Fulton. As I was whipping you, Bobby Fulton, I heard you weeping, and you were crying, crying for your partner, Tommy Rogers, to come save you. But he can do it because you already beat him up earlier. So it goes into the match. It's the Midnight Express versus Tony Super and Trent Knight. It's a Midnight Express squash. Cornette is running down Bobby Fulton's mother. Heard the line earlier about Bobby Fulton's mama and her neighbors being upset about the whipping. Calls her a no-good slag. And basically said he hoped she died of a heart attack. Wow, that's not nice. He says this line, and Tony Schiavone says, Jim, for goodness sakes! Couldn't take this. The Express win with the rocket launcher, and Cornette says, The Fantastic stole this move. This is the original rocket launcher. The Fantastics are trying to steal our thunder! And that's me trying to squeal like Cornette through the voice I have right now. It's terrible. Yeah. Ross claims he's literally foaming at the mouth. Cornette whipped Trent Knight in the middle of this match. And then Eaton goes over, drags Super to the announce table, and beats him up with a microphone. Technically, both are less dangerous than a baseball bat, but that's also assault. It is. Yeah, that's not very <laughs> Can't nice. Can't do that. The spam slam of the week was Road Warrior Hawk doing a press... For the, it actually was a slam this week, which yeah. is news. Road Warrior Hawk doing unassisted press slam to a big, fat, jiggly guy. It yes. was terrifying. And then speaking of terrifying... Dude, the Varsity Club versus Bob Riddle, George South, and Larry Davis. Significantly more violent than the aftermath of Connor and Khabib. Like, it's not even close. No. There was so much more violence And almost here. as chaotic. They beat the shit out of these guys. They ruined them. Rotunda's suplexing them all over. Rick's just powering guys all over the place. Sullivan's punching and kicking them, biting them. Just ripping them to shreds. It was all, great. All three of them. We've talked about Bob Riddle on the show before and George South many, many times. I think it's the first time we've seen Larry Davis. Now we've seen Larry Davis. Larry Davis here was Humpty Dumpty. He was fat and white and egg-shaped. And he's out there in in uh, tights and a singlet with the biggest, fattest lightning bolt you've ever seen on his belly. 
Like, only his belly is fast, I guess. They beat him most severely. And then in the middle of this beating, Rick Steiner says, I'm going to throw this giant egg over my shoulder. And he just deadlifts this guy up, slams him in the tur- uh, into the turnbuckle, utterly horrifying. And then Rotunda is so eager to show he's horrifying too. He tags in, scurries over, takes the egg, super uh, suplexes it back over the butterfly suplex. Now Sullivan wants to turn. He tags in. He's frantic. He hits a foot stomp and pins him with his foot on the chest. Varsity Club were monsters here. Yes. Pure destruction this was, and it was wonderful and glorious, and then it got better. I'm going to do the Sullivan promo, Vinny, and I want you to be Rotundo at the very end. Oh, God. Um, It was awesome. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. I'll do it if you can't remember. All right. Sullivan comes out, and he says, Jimmy Garvin earlier tonight said the Varsity Club could not hurt him because he's in love with somebody. But that woman that he calls precious. Her name is Patty. Patty with an I. With an I. She's always been Patty to me. She'll always be Patty. And she was Patty to me before Jimmy was ever gorgeous. She was mine, Rick, before she was yours. Says Garvin said the demon was outside the door. He was going to keep him away. But last week in Greensboro, someone actually took the clothes hanger away from him, put it around his neck, and it was Patty. But as she was killing him she was choking the life out of him she looked down and said i can't do it because he says once i touch somebody they're mine forever says in this prince of darkness match the demon is laying beside him every night she was always my patty she's not precious and she will come back someday and sullivan leaves Steiner leaves, and I want to say Rotunda just shouted something like... He jumps in, and he just screams, There's not a tournament we can win! That was it. It's like the Rocky Cup. Go. He wasn't listening to a word Sullivan had he said. He did not for... give a shit about the gravity of that promo. No. The history between these two people. Sullivan talking about the one thing that Jimmy Garvin cares about more than anything in the world, and, and vowing to take it away from him. He just wants to win this damn tournament. There's no tournament we can't win. Damn it. So, this yes. This is so great. Between him and Garvin, this should have been like feud of the year. It really should have been. It's so awesome. They should cancel the Crockett Cup and just focus on this one match. The Prince of Darkness death match on April 22nd. And I believe Greenville, South Carolina, if I have that right. God, it was One great. of the Greens, one of the Carolinas. It was awesome. And the other thing is... I can't help but note the amazing irony in 1988, Kevin Sullivan doing a program about how he had a woman and she left him for someone else. Now they're feuding. Yep. He's psychic. Yep. Yep. He says this happens in wrestling. He did. This happens in real life. He says in real life. Yeah. If only he knew. Yeah. Ivan Koloff versus Curtis Thompson in the main event. Koloff won. It sucked. Because of Thompson. I want to clarify. He was not very good. And Ivan said, fuck this. And he pinned him. So, Paul Jones is cutting a promo. You remember the Paul Jones promo just now? <laughs> so awesome. Paul Jones is the greatest. <laughs> He's absolutely the greatest bumbling. There's like, there's main event managers. Okay, there's there's J.J. Dillon, who is a main event professional serious manager. Mm-hmm. There's, J, there's uh, Jim Cornette, who is a comic book villain, top manager. Mm-hmm. And there's Paul Jones, who's a bumbling fool. Opening card comedy manager. Opening card numbskull nincompoop manager. Yes. Managing, like, a bunch of mid-card dorks. (laughs) But, like, they give him a little bit of credibility. This fucking promo. He starts out by saying, My men, the powers of pain, they are seated number one! And David Crockett says, Five, Paul. They're seated number five. Paul is stunned that David would say this. This must be a mistake. I must talk to someone. For now, they're number one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll look into it, he says. And but his, for now, they are number one. He's just decided he has created his own reality. <laughs> the powers of pain are number one, so just go with it. Yes. Promises to take the Road Warriors out before the Crockett Cup. He says, we beat the Road Warriors. Mm-hmm. That's why we should be number one. And then, I have no idea why, he alerts us that the Road Warriors are not smart. 
but they're strong. Well, all right. To emphasize, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? <laughs> to emphasize that they were the strongest men in wrestling until the powers of pain ah, came along. I yeah. see. So uh, let's then see. it gets even weirder. <laughs> he says the powers of pain will win as long as they keep training with Ivan Koloff. They'll win the Crockett Cup. Yes. They go to Ivan. Ivan starts talking about how his partner is Dick Murdoch. Yeah. In the same tournament. Yes. So he's got another partner, but he's training the powers of pain to win the tournament. This is a conflict of interest. <laughs> it seems like this should be. Paul Jones is oblivious to. Yes. He's completely oblivious to this. I guess he just figures, you know. Worst case scenario. Ivan's going to be in the tournament. It's, an, it's inevitable. He's not going to win. It's inevitable that my two teams will meet in the finals. And then I guess two of my men against one of my men. I guess he assumes. Therefore, the powers of pain will win. I guess he assumes Ivan and and, and Dick will do the right thing and lay down. Actually, Dick's one of his men, too. Yeah. I don't know what he's thinking. He's he's uh, um, that's the opposite of putting all your eggs in one basket. Diversifying. I guess covering his bases. He is diversifying. He's he's got a he's got a backup plan, a plan B. Should something terrible happen to the powers of pain? Hmm. I don't know. I loved this promo. It was awesome. Everything I love about professional wrestling in this promo right here. So, yeah, I don't know if there was a great match this week or even a great horrible match, but a lot of great promos. Great promos. Especially Jimmy Garvin and Kevin Sullivan. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. So there you go. That was uh, the one, mat- one match we watched from Black Label Pro, the darkest timeline. Yes, powerbomb.tv. Yeah. So then, NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 9th, 1988. We had clips of the Fantastics and Midnights from the Clash of the Champions. And then the announcers opened the show for what felt like about 12 minutes, just talking about nothing. Dude, the show was an hour and five minutes long. I know. And absolutely nothing happened except for one fun angle. Yes. And it was just, like, still fun. It was a lot of fun. So they talked about Dusty Forever. They talked about the Crockett Cup. They promised the debut of a new young wrestler. They talked about Fantastics and Midnights for a bit. Who the hell was a new young wrestler? Oh, we'll get to it. If you've forgotten. It I'll... can't be the Midnight. Of course it what? was. Of course it oh, was. Oh, fuck. They actually called him young? <laughs> yes. Jesus Christ. A new young wrestler. Oh, Fantastics versus Art Pritz and At Big least they could say like a fresh new star or something like that. Did they have to say young <laughs> Dude, it makes me want to vomit. <laughs> Young new wrestler. Fantastics versus Art Pritz and Big Bear Collie. Okay, so I, on several occasions, have compared Big Bear Collie to Scott Norton. Yes. And I was alerted for about the third time, I think, that he's not Scott Norton. Okay. I actually didn't think he was Scott Norton. Mm. I just said he looked like a young Scott Norton. Yes. He is Barry Collie. That's his name. Okay. They called him Big Bear Collie. Sure. Barry. Bear. Big Bear. I'm with you. There's a total dusty thing. Okay. So anyway, it's Barry Cauley. Cool. He's not Scott Norton. Good. Yeah. Good. Anytime. Uh, I got all sorts of facts. This is a fun squash match, except that it went forever. It was, there was like no point. It wasn't like a, a Ricky Santana or Shane Douglas squash where they're just doing an arm bar for 20 minutes. It's just that they do... But they keep doing stuff, and you realize this they is... They do this with the baby faces sometimes. Yeah. They go out there, and they just beat up jobbers for like 10 minutes. Forever. Everybody cheers and screams, mm-hmm. and it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I thought that Art Pritz actually did a good job, and the fans were going nuts for the Fantastics, yep. and it was enjoyable wrestling. They won with a rocket launcher. I was hoping a few minutes uh, before that, they basically did a double knockout punch. Where they, the guy got to his feet, and they both of the big windup and a simultaneous haymaker from either side. Which would have been a great finish. And one with the rocket launcher. So they go to commercial. They come back. They put on their jackets. They put on their bow ties for the promo. They had caught their breath, but they're still sweating like crazy. Because they had wrestled a long time. They are not good promos. Not especially, no. Vinny, they're horrible. <laughs> this is just a terrible promo. They're very frustrated. They threw the ref over the top rope. But they did hit their finish. And they did get a pinfall. And they want those U.S. straps. Mm-hmm. And they have their own straps for Cornette and the Midnights as well. Yeah. Plug the Crockett Cup in the one million. They love to win a million dollars. They love to beat the Midnights along the way for good measure. And then Tommy told his dad to get well soon. Larry Zabisco and Al Perez versus Ricky Santana and Tommy Angel. This was different. This was awesome. This was fun. I hope they keep doing this. So what you've got here is a heel tag team 
of two names, and the Bay of Ace team is one name in Ricky Santana and one geek in Tommy Angel. Boy, was he ever a geek. So for five minutes, it was Santana versus the Heels basically doing a one-on-two handicap match, and it was really, really good. Well, it was more than that. Al Perez yes. is being called by his manager the greatest, I forget what, Latin? I think uh, they called him the greatest, greatest Latin, Latin superstar. The greatest Latin superstar. And, of course, Ricky Santana. Mm-hmm. Well, he believes he's the greatest Latin superstar. Naturally. They have a fucking fight over it. Yes. <laughs> this is the Listen, feud they're building. I cannot handle Ricky Santana wrestling matches. You understand? They're so damn boring. Oh, yeah. But, man, when he got in here with Al Perez mm-hmm. and they were fighting over who was the best Latin. Yeah. I believe that's what they called him last week. The best Latin. Not the best Latino. No. Th- they literally said the best Latin. Noun. Latin. Well, they were fighting over who was the best Latin, and they got into it, and it was awesome. It was awesome. So and Tommy Angel tagged in, and it fucking fell off a cliff. <laughs> it just destroyed him? It, it sucks. It went from like a very competitive, high-action match to a total squash, just in, in one tag. And they beat the hell out of Tommy Angel. Al hit his finishers, which are basically a spinning razor's edge, and then a spinning toe hold for the win. By the way, Larry Zabisco, still the Western States Heritage Champion. Why? He may still be to this day, Vinny. The UWF I, I is gone and I dead. I looked it up. Even Steve Williams made a joke about how the, the, the company's gone forever now. But Larry is still carrying this belt around. So they do a promo after the break. Gary Hart does most of the talking. He demands that Larry Zabisco's pile driver be reinstated as a legal maneuver. No more crybaby prima donnas taking moves away. Why did it get banned in the first place? I forgot. Do we even remember? I think this is the pile driver's been banned in this territory for I see. 50 years. Yeah. So uh, he talks about Dusty and Nikita, what the pile driver and the tow hold would do to the two of them. He promises his men are going to win a million dollars. And he's sure to remind him, and then I get 30%. So Larry talks about how the superpowers are the defending champs, but he knows they can beat the superpowers. That means they can win, them, win themselves. And Al Perez said literally nothing. Yeah, he sucks. <laughs> His hey, promos suck. Great. Yeah. That's had, the job of a manager. That's what a manager's there for. And Larry's a great talker, too. Steve Williams versus Alan Martin. God, Alan Martin did, in fact, look like... He looked like Marco Stunt in there with Steve Williams. You no, know, he looked like a giant Marco Stunt. He still looked bigger than Marco Stunt, but he did not look big. He looked like maybe Marco's dad. Sure. If Marco's dad married a very, very, very small woman... And they produced young Marco. I see. He looked like a 5'7 Marco stunt. Which is a lot bigger. About 180 pounds, yeah. which is 100 pounds bigger. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Death went in there and did what I am going to do to Marco on November 3rd. Except okay. he did it quick. That's the difference. Ha-ha. Yeah. He beat the shit out of him. This was awesome. Killed him with a clothesline. <laughs> backdropped him onto his ass. Yep. Speared him to death. And the best part is he gives him the spear. And Alan Martin takes his giant fucking bump, and then he rolls to the middle of the ring, and he lays there like a dead man, because he's, like, begging for Steve Williams to just pin him now. And he didn't. No, no. No, Steve's got to hit the stampede. And did he hit that stampede, Dude. and they both bounced 10 feet in the air. <laughs> he did the stamp. Usually when you do the running power slam, you, you know, let the guy up over your shoulder, you take a few steps, and you just go straight down. Doc jumped through the air like he was trying to dive over a hurdle. <laughs> He went forward more than he went up. Just this massive, giant slam and landed with all 300 pounds on top of the guy and finally mercifully pinned him. It's not only that. I watched... Well, they do the slow-mo replay. And there's this slow-mo replay of the slam. And it's not like WWE where... This fucking drives me nuts. There's a big move in WWE. They show the slow motion and then all of a sudden they speed it up for the end, the impact. Yeah, That's dumb. Yeah, That's not the point of a slow motion. Here they show the whole move in slow motion. So Dr. Death has got him up, and he goes for the power slam, and they hit the mat, and they both start to bounce in the air, and it freezes. And Alan Martin's corpse is levitating. Rigor mortis is set in. He literally looks like a dead... Like, if I would have called in Whitney, and I paused her right there, and I said, what are you watching on the screen? She'd say, well, there's a dead body in the ring. A snuff film, That's Brian. disgusting. You're making me watch a snuff film. I'd say, well, fuck... Did we even mention Doc pressing this guy over his head repeatedly with great, great ease? Well, yeah. So yeah, this is a five-star squash, and Dr. Death was like a nuclear weapon here. They plugged the NWA main event show, which is on Sundays. Apparently nobody was watching it. Mm-hmm. I guess it's an early morning show. 
eight oh five a.m. on the West Coast uh, on a Sunday. They were yeah they got, they got moved around due to Braves baseball. Yeah, no one watches at eight oh five a.m. on a Sunday. No, no, they don't. So we went to the board of directors meeting. Oh, this is great. The fate of Dusty Rhodes. Just a little tiny ghetto room. Just it's just an office, a desk, an office space, a table with eight or nine people around it, and at one end of the table is Jim Crockett, Dusty Rhodes, the uh, NWA spokesman, who I don't remember, remember who it was, and Paul Bosch. And the other end of the table is J.J. Dillon, who is there, of course, to represent Tilly Blanchard and the Horsemen. So the spokesman says, we have come to a, a, a decision. There was a vote. It was not unanimous, but we have decided Dusty Rhodes has been suspended worldwide for 120 oh, days. Oh, my God. Four months. 120 days. He has also been That's four months. Also been stripped of the United States title. I guarantee you that Khabib will not be no, suspended no. and stripped of his title. Not a chance in hell. For that length of time. No. So, Bosch, is the, as the decision is announced, Bosch is very upset. Dusty has a statement. He apologizes to the board uh, for his actions. He apologizes to Jim Crockett for hitting him with a baseball bat and nearly killing him. But he will not apologize to J.J. J. Dillon. And he goes in a weird speech. Says, the same day his son was born, his friend passed away, doors close and doors open, and he won't be responsible for his actions. That's the bottom line. Yeah. He storms out. Tony tries to interview him. He won't give Tony a word. Bosch stops to talk to Tony. This is 50 plus years. I've never had my stomach grind like this. The punishment does not fit the crime. It's too harsh. It's too severe. And then Jim Crockett, the most chariz- charismaless man. What's the opposite of, opposite of a fountain of charisma? A black hole of charisma. It was a majority vote. Not unanimous. Nothing else to say. I, even that was too much energy. Yeah. Too much disgust. Hey, I thought this was a nice little segment. I liked it. I I just liked it. They got it done. It was it, it felt like it was like the real deal. It felt legit. It wasn't some goofy thing where they made a bunch of jokes. It no. Was, it was a very, very no. serious thing, and it was a very, very serious thing that Dusty yeah. had done. No, they, they didn't drag it out forever. No one had a huge histrionic speech. There was no, no, no catchphrases or taglines. An announcement was, well, a, a decision was announced. Yeah. There was some reaction to it, and it ended. Yep. Great. Nikita Koloff and his hair versus Ryan Wagner. Not only his hair, but like he's he's so small now. He's leaner. He left and he dropped a bunch of muscle. And literally, he's, he's grew his hair. Mm-hmm. So he's gone from looking like Goldberg to now kind of looking like The Miz with a goatee and a singlet. Mm-hmm. That's the difference in their physiques and their hair. Yeah. I mean, he totally doesn't look like Goldberg anymore at all. And anyway. No. He wins with a sickle in two minutes. Ross claims he's back bigger and stronger than ever. I was like, what? That's a lie. That is, in fact, an incorrect statement, Jim Ross. Mm -hmm. So Nikita has to cut a promo, and he can just barely compose himself. Leaning over on the apron for support, back to the camera. The fate of his friend Dusty Rhodes has has left him in a a state. Finally, he gathers himself and says, Dusty pulled me aside before the news broke. He wanted me to hear from himself. He didn't want me to hear it on TV. So he told me the news. It did not feel good. It didn't feel good to these people either. And they all cheer. So, so the Crockett Cup is coming up, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't care about the money. I want competition. This guy needs to start caring about the money, dude. This is fucking... It's not show friends. It's show business. Yes. It's not even show competition. Show business. Show business. He said he hoped to announce something for the Crockett Cup next week. And he also said, I heard Gary Hart talking out here. I want Gary Hart to shut his mouth. There's a Road Warriors promo in here, by the way, that you missed. Animal sick of what the end of the I did miss that. I'm sorry. My bad. Crowd's going crazy. Paul says, our brother Hawk is getting better and he's getting ready. Yeah. Guess something happened to Hawk. Ellering here, by the way, also mentioned I talked to the Midnight Rider. Mm. And I'm sure everyone said, who? What? Let's see. <laughs> oh, this is great. Oh, the Luger Wyndham promo. Lex Luger begins. Says, you know, I've been watching these shows, and I have to admit, I have been hogging the spotlight. I've been yanking my shirt off, flexing for the people. My bad. I'm going to step back and give Barry Wyndham a chance to speak. And then everything Barry says, Lex butts in and gives his opinion on the matter. 
It's so awesome. Finally, he shuts up, and Barry is very solemn, talking about Dusty Rhodes, Magnum T.A., Tully Blanchard. And he finishes, and like says, Okay, I've been patient. Time to talk about how great we are now. I can't contain myself. I gotta take off my shirt. He rips his shirt off and flexes. The women all scream. Says, Nothing can stop us. Thank you, Tony. And he leaves. So Luger was, this is like the second thing. We saw the one on Nitro where he had to pretend like he wasn't scared. Yes. yes. That was awesome. Then they had one here where he had to pretend like... He had to uh, pretend to be humble. Yeah. And the thing was, when he hands the mic to Barry, he still has to butt in twice yeah. before Barry finally gets going. And he should just talk because Barry just quietly mumbled his way through a promo. I understand a word he said. Crowd screaming. And then Luger goes nuts. And my favorite part is Luger goes, How are we seated? They give him his number, and he goes, it doesn't matter where we're seated. <laughs> like, why'd you ask then, you jackass? <laughs> and then he was just a madman. But yes, Lex just can't help himself. He has to have the spotlight. Oh, it's brilliant. It is time for the introduction of the young new athlete. Oh, here we it's go. A, we promise you folks, a young new star. Let's go to this video. So the video is the Midnight Rider, who, if you're not aware, is Dusty Rhodes under a mask. Oh, what are you talking about? He has a horse named Diablo and Magnum T.A., and they are gathered around a campfire, allegedly talking. Because you see, yes, in, when this was originally produced in 1988, they used a copyrighted version of the Midnight Rider. It wasn't uh, You played it. You found it on some... It's, it's on YouTube. Yeah. It's easy to find. Yeah, and uh, it's not the Allman Brothers version. Maybe Willie Nelson, I'm not sure, but they're playing the Midnight Rider, which, of course, you can't play on the network. And I've seen a hundred video packages where they were able to, or, or even most entrances, where they're able to edit the music out, but you can still have commentary or the fan noise or whatever. Not this one. Well, you got to remember that, like some of the times when they edit it out, it's like they just they just silence it. They put in new music and new crowd noise. I guess. So, I mean, this one here, they could not get this music out in any like convenient way. No. They they just edited in a super loud, <laughs> super generic guitar riff. Mm-hmm. There's and country music playing. There's boot stomping going on. You could barely hear the promo. You could tell it was. It sounded like Dusty. It sounded familiar. It sounded. I couldn't like quite Dusty place Rhodes. it. Yeah, but yes, it, he he uh, he. It was Dusty's voice and his cadence, his catchphrases. Well, you know, a lot of guys they they really respected Dusty Vinny, and they they wanted to be him, and they wanted to talk like him he was a very influential promo he was very influential that's an excellent word influential yes. and the midnight rider was influenced heavily by dusty Rhodes. yes it's very clear he promises violence like you've never seen before and a camera pans up to like the moon yes <laughs> and then the graphics appear that read watch for the midnight rider yes all caps no punctuation yes this is so, so awesome i can even understand 10 percent or 90 percent of it Okay, Arn and Tully beat Kendall and Mike, Kendall Winter and Mike Jackson. No, it don't matter. They won with a DDT. They go to do a promo. J.J. Dillon <laughs> is sick of this shit. How can you stand here with a straight face, Tony Schiavone, and look at that monitor and see the Midnight Rider and pretend it's not Dusty Rhodes? The best part is, like, if you watch the video, all right, sure as hell sounded like Dusty Rhodes. But it was a fucking guy in a trench coat with a mask on mm-hmm. and a hat. So Ross wants to know, well, why do you think it's Dusty? And J.J. takes off his glasses and says, I spent a lot of money on these glasses. How about I listen to him? <laughs> that also works. I mean, come on. Of all of the evidence, I mean, the oral evidence, aural, A-U-R-A-L. Audio. The audio evidence is far stronger than the video evidence. Suppose that's true. I like when you ask that question, and, and, and Tully, off mic, just says, because he's a man of intelligence. So Dylan goes on a rant how he's going to go back to the board of directors, make them watch this video, make them take action. He says, before we had a chance to celebrate, we've been trying to get rid of Dusty Rhodes for 10 years. Before we had a chance to celebrate and pop the champagne, I had to see the Midnight Rider. And he's just disgusted, and he leaves in a huff. This was awesome. Sting versus the Destroyer. Not Dick Byer. No, not that Destroyer. Which is too bad. Although this Destroyer was not too bad. 
I guess. It went one minute. Well, he could hit the ropes. Yeah. He could bump. He knew where to be. Yeah. He, I'm sure he was someone good. I'm sure he was fine. All right, so we haven't. So Sting press slams him, hits a stinger splash, Scorpion and wins, and then he cuts a promo. Actually, he cut like six promos. Six different unrelated promos in one segment. He's completely out of his mind. He's a madman. He's talking about the Crockett Cup. He says, I can think of so many unnecessary ways to blow a million dollars. That's what he said. He's cutting this wild man for the place. is going absolutely crazy. He's going to buy a, par- he's going to buy a party for all the fans. Yeah. yeah. Cool. For a million dollars. Yeah. That's a hell of a party. That's a, hell- well, a lot of fans. 86, 87, 88. That's a hell of a party. That's actually a good point. Says, I'm teaming with Ronnie Garvin. And when it comes to Ronnie Garvin, Tahihi. Hey, hey, you may not understand, but you will. I didn't understand. It's 30 years later. I still don't understand. So talks about Dusty Rhodes. Says, the only problem with Dusty Rhodes is he didn't beat up Tully Blanchard enough. Dusty did the right thing. And if he had a chance to do all again, he'd do the same thing. And there's this pause. Like, I think Ross expected him to say more. And Sting just shouts at him. Any more questions? No. Are you sure? So Ross tries to throw it at commercial. Stings just keeps shouting at him. Catch you later, Rossi. He's going to be out there with Ric Flair. A lunatic. A complete madman. I know it's a weird day to do it, but I think it's pretty clear that Sting needs to go into the Hall of Awesome. This promo was awesome. I, I think, <laughs> I mean, think about when we started watching those old Nitros. Mm-hmm. We started in 95, and we saw all of those angles when Sting was a baby face, and he was so over, and like everything that he did, the place went nuts. And granted, it was kind of hit and miss there in WCW, but he had a great comeback in WWE years later. He, if we're being totally honest, he had a great comeback in TNA. He had a great comeback in TNA. He was super over mm-hmm. in NWA back in the day. That match with Rick, these fucking promos, I think he should go into the Hall of Awesome. If we keep watching this, we've still got like another half a decade of great Sting stuff. Well, we'll see how it goes. You don't want to put him in now? No, no, I'm saying we can't. I'm saying we'll, uh, we're going to watch in the future. I see. But yeah, Sting is totally in the Hall of Awesome. All right, well, he's in. All right, Sting. It's unanimous. The newest member of the Hall of Awesome. That's right. Unlike this vote by the NWA Board of Directors, this one's unanimous. This is unanimous. Yes. There's only two of us. The Matt there Cleary is Memorial- Rob, but I'm not letting him vote. The Matt Cleary Memorial Hall I'm of Awesome. mess this up. Yes. So Sting leaves. After the break, there's a Flair promo. Rick Flair says... No one wants Dusty Rhodes gone more than me. Because of the Dusty gone, I'll be number one. Yeah. I think at this time he's the five-time reigning world champion. But that doesn't matter, Vinny. That doesn't matter. The number one guy that they always build this fucking show around is Dusty Rhodes. Who's booking again? Exactly. <laughs> astonishing. Exactly. Talks about Steve Williams, Nikita Koloff, and Sting, and says none of, that, none of what they're doing matters. I'm going to be champ as long as I want. And I've got a thousand years left in me. Well, he said he put them over as being great, but said that none of them were as great as himself. Yes. He said he wanted to be the man until he decided he needed to jump out of these clothes, which I figured would be that night, and quit styling and profiling, shove all the women aside, and yes, he plans to be the man for a thousand years. He came close. (laughs) I was going to say he hasn't been proven wrong yet. I mean, you know, you got to remember at that time, they were already thinking like, this fucking guy's too old. Here in 88. Yes. 1988. Ron Garvin beat Bob Emery in t- with a punch in 20 seconds. Yep. I think it was this point when Rob got here. And uh, the last, like, four matches in the show, I don't think any of them went more than 60 seconds. So Rob just saw, like, punch, pin, stomp, pin, power slam, pin, or whatever. Jim Crockett came out for a promo in the biggest, thickest glasses he ever saw. He looked like Bubbles from Trailer Park Boys. He promised Dusty would fulfill his dates through April 15th. It was a show in Boston. That would be his last night. And then his suspension would begin. And this meant they needed a new team for the Crockett Cup. So said Nikita told them they'd have a new partner by next week. That was really about it. I think he, I, I didn't write it down. I think he dropped a hint here about some other alternative. Well, he said that next week, next week, Nikita gets to choose a new partner yeah. to replace Dusty. And he says he's going to let us know who it is next week. Dusty can wrestle up to the 15th. They've got a show in Boston, which is Dusty's last night and also the night the Midnight's face the Fantastics again. And then Cornette shows up, and he wants to whip Bobby Fulton's mother, that old hag. 
He wants to whip all the fans. And he whips all the, he wants to whip all, whip all those fans. But they don't have time. So just whip the Fantastics all over the country. Who could Nikita possibly choose? Well, I was going to say, uh, there was a line in there. I, I didn't write it down. I should have. Uh, but he mentioned something about an alter- uh, some, some other choice. I think Nikita ends up challenging Flair. Mm. Oh, that's right. That does happen. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because they announced it a week before. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I think that's what, that, that's what ends up going on here. Why didn't he choose the Midnight Rider? I agree. Uh, uh, I think Midnight, I think Ryder on uh, that show does a match with Dylan, actually. Mm, oh, that's right. They do a, a bull uh, rope match. Bull rope match, yeah. I, I, I think that that's the show. I remember 30 years later a great promo <laughs> Dylan cut about that match. They absolutely are doing that on that show. Yeah. So, yeah, Cornette cut his promo. He's being all crazy. And Bob Eaton's there and does like a t shirt and jeans. Stan's got these wacky purple sunglasses on because it's the 80s and some fancy 80s shirt with neon on it. It looks silly now, but at the time, it was just like what you wear when you go out. They're just two regular dudes, and Cornette is this lunatic madman behind them. <laughs> that makes it all so great, though. That's his job, dude. And that's their job as well. Yeah. Their job is to be normal so he looks even weirder. Varsity Club versus El Negro and Tony Bowen. Foot Stomp wins in 30 seconds. El Negro did literally, literally nothing. It was Sullivan this week with Rotunda. Yes. And Rick Steiner's outside. And then Sullivan does another one of his promos. He says, I remember the first time the Midnight Rider rode. He broke bones. He ended careers. Talked about what he did to Purple Haze and Kendo Nagasaki and other men. The dark side of Dusty is coming out. Yes. I hate everybody, but I think about what he did to Tully. And that is nothing compared to the darkness of the Midnight Rider. Yes, and he says, I don't like the horsemen. I don't like Jim Cornette and his men. But if we don't team up and work together... The Midnight Rider is going to pick us off one by one. Some serious business there. Dick Murdoch and the Barbarian and the Warlord versus Larry Davis, Italian Stallion, and Tony Suber. Thank God Dick Murdoch is back. He grabs his Larry Davis. I mean this in the nicest way possible. Larry Davis is a sack of shit. And Murdoch tries to lift him up for the Brain Buster. And this the nicest way possible, you say. Guy, just deadlifts him or, or dead, dead weights, weights him. him. Yes. So Murdoch has to deadlift his dead weight. Yes. And, and he lifts Dick him Mur- like fucking halfway up, and it's like, all right, you got the guy halfway up. You got two options. Put him down and try again. And, of course, if you put him down and try again, there's no guarantee the guy's going up the second time. Good point, yeah. So the other option is, well, he's halfway up. I'll fucking drop him on his head now. <laughs> That's what Murdoch chose. He dropped this fucking guy right on his head, and that was the end of Larry. I think so. He pinned him. You gotta he had to have retired after this. Larry is a fat guy, and frankly, so is Murdoch. You know Dick Murdoch contrasted here with the Barbarian and the Warlord. Yes. Two big, giant, swole dudes. Murdoch's this pudgy, skinny-legged, Middle-aged guy, bigger than your average fan, but nothing, nothing compared to a 1980s pro wrestler. And when you're watching this, the, 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 this skinny, fat guy trying to get this butterball up for a brain buster and failing and dropping on his head, somehow, I think, not killing him. It wasn't Murdoch's fault. I'm not saying it's Murdoch's fault at all. I'm saying as a visual, well, <laughs> that made yeah. it even weirder. All I could think was, that fucking guy sucks. Yes. Like, <laughs> you're, here's the thing. You're about to take a yes, brain buster. Yes. You've got to go vertical. For your own sake. Yes. Get up there as high as you can. This fucking go up guy. Light as a fe- you- yeah. So I hope he never worked again after that. It's too dangerous for himself. Yes. So there you go to cut the show, uh, the show closing promo. Okay, so first off, during the match, the announcers state that the Warlord and the Barbarian are the number five seeds. Mm, okay. Which, by the way, when they said that, I was like, they're seated higher than Luger and Wyndham? Well, the seeding was done before they won the titles. I guess. Tully and Arn, Tully and Arn technically are still the top seed, I think. Yeah. So anyway, they announced they're the number five seeds. They go to Paul Jones, and the first thing he talks about is his men, the number three seeds. I don't even know. Because he doesn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> he has no idea what's going on. He just makes a bunch of shit up. Talks about Dickie Murdoch. <laughs> Well, I think he forgot. I think he legit forgot Murdoch's name for a second. Yes, I've got the best bounty hunter in wrestling. I've got Murdoch, Dicky Murdoch, and he goes on. He's got the number three seed and the number ten seed because he got Ivan Koloff and Murdoch. 
And then Murdoch speaks. And at first, he's all wired up, out of his mind, happy redneck guy, talking about how all his friends are going to come to the Carolinas, watch him win a million dollars. And he says, all right, it's time to get calm and time to get serious. Everyone knows that's Dusty Rhodes into that mask. Jim Barnett knows. Jim Crockett knows. Dusty Rhodes is going to clean house. I've got my combat boots. I've got my fighting gear. I'm ready for him. And then the powers of pain flexed, and the show ended. I like how we are done with the show, and you decided to adjust the audio. I just fixed one thing right there. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was a show, and I liked it. It was a lot of fun. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. <laughs> Talk more about it as the days and weeks go on. I had a hell of a time. So we'll get into that here in a moment. Let's let's get this NWA over with. Start this with the, wretched show. Start with the bad stuff. NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 16th, 1988. Don't watch this show, everybody. Repeat that again, Vinny. April, April 16th, 16th, 1988. Okay, if you're thinking of watching the April 16, 1998 NWA World Championship Wrestling on the WWE Network, do something better with your life. Powerbomb.tv, Black Label Pro. Fuck anything on there. Anything on Powerbomb TV is better than this. This is the go-home show. Can you imagine? <laughs> For the Crockett Cup. Dude, I didn't care that much about the Crockett Cup, but like when this show was over, I did not give two shits about the Crockett Cup. If I never see the Crockett Cup ever again or hear those words, it'll be too soon. And I'm going to hear them next year because they're doing another one. That's right. Which will be better than this one. We have footage of the Midnight Rider riding his goddamn horse into arena. One of the rare shining things on this which show. Which sounds like fun, but then we never saw anything about it again. The rider or the horse. It was a teaser. So the announcers are running down the show. Jim Cornette interrupts with a strap, whips the podium a bunch. Before he interrupts, they announced it tonight on the show. They said, we were going to see what the NWA board, or more specifically, Jim Crockett Jr., had to say about J.J.'s complaints regarding the Midnight Rider. And right then I thought, man, something good's coming tonight. You know what? Something good was coming. Unfortunately, it was the only good thing on the entire show. Yes. And they promise an interview with the actual Dusty Rhodes next week. Which also sounds like it's going to be good. He's had a lot of time to think. He has had a lot of time to think. And what is he going to say about the Midnight Rider? Let's we'll see how it goes. Midnight Express versus Trent Knight and George South. We watch George South in the show pretty much every week. I don't know what was up with his hair. It was like half afro, half mullet. That's what it always looks like. Yeah, but it's something extra George Southy about it. Maybe there was no conditioner in the shower. They may not have been. They may not have been. So Coronet is running wild, trashing every single team in the Crockett Cup, and then he gets to the heel teams, and he runs them down in a very polite manner. He's not insult the Four Horsemen or the Powers of Pain or the Varsity Club, but he's sure to mention that his men will do everything they can to beat those men, and they can all shake hands and be friends again afterwards. So the Express went with the rocket launcher. Then we get another Jim Cornette promo. The best part of this act, I've decided, is that it's not just Cornette by himself, although Cornette is great, but the fact that Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane are well aware of what a giant goofball Jim Cornette is. Oh, of course they are. But he, but he makes them money. He makes them money. He makes them champions. And helps them win matches. Yes. So they, they tolerate his idiocy. Yes. They're, I know all about this. They are so, how dare you? They are so much cooler than him. They just sit there, biding their time, letting him run his mouth while they scan the crowd for talent. Yes. It's a fantastic act. And uh, that was really it. Cornette just talked about how there was a 42-minute match they had with the Fantastics, and one of these days the Fantastics were going to run out of time, and the Midnight's going to injure them and put them out of wrestling forever. He said they're going to... One of these days they're going to cripple him, he says. Mm -hmm. And no matter what limb gets broken, he's still going to whip them. And he wants to make sure they're not unconscious. He wants them to be awake so he can hear them cry and squeal and scream. He was out of his mind, but he was awesome. Dick Murdoch versus Larry Stevens. Murdoch sells just a bit, then it starts to take Just him. a bit? Dude, he gave this guy like five minutes of headlocks. Larry Stevens! Yeah, that happened. I don't know if he was in a good mood. I mean, he must have been in a good mood. So he takes it killed this guy. Takes him apart in and out of the ring, hits him with a chair, ref takes it away. It's outside the ring, so not a DQ. The funny thing is, it's not like the, there's no stuff under the ring. He had to go like, backstage to find a chair. Yeah. Hit him with. And then he hit him with like a 10 second brain buster. Just held him up there forever. And we had a Dick Murdoch promo. 
This was the most low-key Dick Murdoch promo I may have ever seen in my life. It was low-key. He didn't raise his voice. But 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 focused, and there's still an intensity to it. He stayed white. He did, he did not turn red. Rare. Captain Redneck did not go red-faced. No. But he had a point to make, and he made it clearly and concisely. And the reason he was so calm, Brian, is this was a job interview for Dick Murdoch. He wanted to impress people. He explains, Dusty Rhodes is mad. I warned you all to get combat boots. We're all going to be in for a little bit of combat. Now, you all think, I, I warned you Dusty Rhodes is going to come after you. I warned you he's more dangerous than ever. And you all think your men and your team is going to be able to protect you, and they won't. No one knows Dusty Rhodes better than me. For many years, we teamed together, ate together, drank together. Chased, a lot of eating. Chased sleazy women together. Now, your teams won't be able to get rid of Dusty, but I can. And if you hire me, I will get the job done. And that was it. Like I say, a job interview. I do love that Murdoch is proud that they didn't chase beautiful women. No. High-class women. No. They chased them sleazy women. <laughs> yeah. And by chasing, the sleazy women were running from Dick Murdoch and Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> he may have been. It's happening. Your door is very She squeaky. walked by right at the right time. Okay. Lex Luger versus Art Pritz. Show went, uh, match went two minutes. Lex went with a torture rack. And he cuts a promo. So, Lex Luger and Barry Windham are the world tag team champions, right? Uh, as far as I know, yeah, yeah unless it, they changed. Yeah, the world tag unless team, it's Nitro. It's not, it's not Nitro, nor is it Raw, as we'll talk about on Tuesday. Uh, Lex Luger and Barry Windham are world tag team champions. One of the higher rated seeds going into the Crockett Cup tournament. Everyone remember that for next week's review show. Lex is here solo today. He explains they were finally on the, an angle's coming. They were on the beach. Finally, they were at the beach. Lex Luger and Barry Windham were, and they flipped a coin to see who would stay at the beach, and who would go to who would go to work. I can't believe Lex even put it up to a coin flip. And as Lex says, obviously, I lost. <laughs> the loser has to come wrestle. And he talked about Flair for three, four hours. I don't know. He said that sooner or later, Flair would have to acknowledge the total package. He's not going anywhere. If Flair wants to prove he's the best. To be the man, you got to beat the man. He says, Flair, when we meet, when the title switches hands, there will be no sixth time for Ric Flair. Yes. Boy. He was mistaken. Foreshadowing <laughs> a lot of different things right there. Yes. J.J. Dillon meets with Jim Crockett Jr. J.J. explains, I have been trying all week to get a meeting with the board of directors. I've been trying to get a face-to-face -face interview with you here. I have gone through the trouble and expense of hiring this cameraman to film us to uh, film us our conversation. I have a monitor here and a videotape, a videotape which I will present to you. And he had one of those classic 1980s videotape cases. It's like the size of home plate. Just a, 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 a saucer. Enormous. Yeah. Because I'm going to make you watch this. Then I'm going to give you a copy. But I want a record from, a comment from you on the record, a public statement on the Midnight Rider. Now watch this. They show the Midnight Rider video. It's the same one from last week. The whole thing. Went a while. All over again. Everything involving Dusty Rhodes, you know you're going to see the whole thing <laughs> 50 times. They did change the music. I could hear a little more of what he said. Yes. But it's still happy country western music as the writer's talking about violence like you've never seen before. <laughs> yeah. The, the people that have to take the old music out and put the new music in. My conclusion is that they know of the Midnight Rider. And to them, it's like, funny. And so when they had to choose the music to replace it with, they chose this upbeat comedy sort of music. Yeah. When in reality, it was supposed to be like a... Well, the, the original... Hell is coming. The Midnight Rider song is not a... It's not the Road Warriors theme. No, no, no. But I mean, the whole gimmick here, if you watch the show, is supposed to be... Yes. This man is coming. He's, and hell is coming he, with him. We're all supposed to believe... That the Midnight Rider is the most dangerous wrestler we've ever seen. Yes, and meanwhile, this is this is the Three Amigos. They're they're playing a square dance. I don't know. Yes. So the video concludes. We go back to JJ and Crockett, and JJ Dillon says, "There you have it. Conclusive, undeniable, irrefutable proof that the Midnight Rider is Dusty Rhodes." Crockett says, "I don't see it that way. You must need glasses." Are we watching two different tapes? We're watching two different tapes. JJ's response is just, "Well." This is becoming a very, very frustrating situation. 
wants to know, what kind of proof do I need to offer you? Do I need to get the Midnight Rider in a ring? Do I need to get a sanctioned official there? Do I need to tear the mask off the Midnight Rider, shove the referee's face in that face, and prove it's Dusty Rhodes? Crockett says, that would be proof. I mean, to be fair, the guy has a mask on. He's, I mean, I mean, he's got we a don't know for sure. On. He's got a Texas accent. It, it, it seems that it could There's be lots Dusty of fat Rhodes, guys in hey, Texas. I, I would need to see his face for it to be irrefutable proof. I don't think this would pass in the court of law as a beyond no, a reasonable doubt. You need more than that. There's a lot of fat guys in Texas who this could be. Like so, nobody can do a Dusty Rhodes impersonation. <laughs> I've never heard that before. So. JJ makes this, you know, repeats this and, and uh, confirms that if he gets the Midnight Rider in a ring, and if there's a sanctioned official in the ring, and if he can pull his mask off, proving it's Dusty Rhodes, that will prove Dusty violated his 120 day suspension, and he will then be suspension, suspended for one year. Oh my God, a full year. And he gets this confirmed, and he cackles and cackles and cackles. Because to him, Dusty Rhodes is so old and over the hill. Well, if, they, he is, if he is forced to be out for a year, his career is just, they, it's over. They talked about this for the 30-day suspension with Massive yes. Luger last year. Which yes. Is, I guess four months ago in, in their calendar. Uh, 30 days would be the, the end of his career. And in that time, that you'll fall out of the limelight. Someone will pass you on the totem pole. Sure, So yeah. imagine what will happen in a year. The whole roster will He's turn done. over. He's yeah. done. He'll be in WWE and polka dot. <laughs> so at this point... Crockett pulls out a contract and says, I happen to have an open contract here for Greensboro on the 23rd. I'll put your name here since you volunteered. He writes J.J. J. Dillon. And J.J.'s muttering, I'm going to be awful busy that night with a tournament and everything. And then Crockett says, well, you know, it's going to be a special occasion. I'm going to make it a special match. Let's make it a Texas bull rope match. And since you've already agreed, your opponent will be the Midnight Rider. Now, when did J.J. agree to do any of this? I mean, to me, he didn't sign this contract. I mean, this, this just like the Midnight Rider, this is not going to hold up in a court of law. Well, it would, except, as we learn later in the show, J.J. in the end did agree with it. I see. Yeah. But yes, uh, all, J.J. laughed and laughed over the possibility of getting the Midnight Rider in a ring, and then when the opportunity presented to actually be in the ring with the Midnight Rider, suddenly he chickened out. Yes. That's great. This was, but it was explained later. This was so awesome. Yes. If this were Raw, it would have ended right here, not making any sense. But it's not Raw, and so later they go to J.J. Dillon, and he does explain, I don't think that I can beat the Midnight Rider. I don't think that I can go in there and beat this man. But I don't have to beat him. I can hit him one time with a cowbell. I just need one opportunity to yank his mask off. That's all I need to do. So he is willing to go in there and get his ass beaten mm -hmm. in a match he cannot win right? just because maybe he can pull this guy's mask off and get him suspended for a year. The, the, the Perfect. The reward is worth the risk. Yes, excellent. I must disagree with you. If this was Raw, this wouldn't have ended here. Uh, I guess it may have ended here, but the point is on Raw, they would have announced the bull rope match first. That's true. Because it's time for the bull rope pay-per-view. Yes. Now there will be a bull rope match. Who will be in it? And then they would go from there. Then they would, then they would yeah. Here, the there's a storyline, and the the angle pays off the storyline rather than vice versa. Yes. And the story sets up the match dips rather than establishing match dips and then trying to fake a story around it. Yes. They're, they're doing it the right way here as opposed to current storytelling, which is done backwards. So, yes, I love this. This yeah, this is awesome. This was the best thing on the show, except for a frog splash later. If you must watch this show, watch this segment only. But don't worry about it, because they'll air it again next week. That's So you may as well just too. skip the show. Powers of Pain versus Steve Atkinson and Bob Riddle. Most of the match was just Ivan hitting dudes with ch uh, chain on the outside. Barbarian wins with an avalanche power slam. He did a Paul Jones promo. First he starts talking about, he starts putting over the Road Warriors. The Road Warriors are the most feared team in the tournament. And I was certain he screwed up. He's got the team name wrong. The Road Warriors are certain if they can beat the Powers of Pain, they'll win the tournament. But no way that will be done! And he talks about how he has two chances to win. He has two teams. Yeah, this is... this this is. I don't know what happens, but this, this can't end well. When I think about it, Paul Jones is the kind of guy who would try to double up his odds of winning... And in the end, fuck himself. Yeah, of course. That's what, Paul that's, Jones, that's what has to happen. That's what here. Paul Jones would do. If it doesn't, this is going to explain why why Crockett sold to Turner. <laughs> Can't do anything right. 
By the way, this barbarian is one awesome, mean-looking, badass dude. Like, the warlord looks like any other 80s guy you'd see in the gym lifting weights. Mm Mm-hmm. Barbarian actually looks like a would, barbarian. The barbarian would beat the fuck out of you. Yes. The warlord would bench press more than you. Yes. You're not sure he'd actually be a tough guy, even y- though he's a yes. big dude. Yes. Barbarian, you would not mess with him. No. So Ivan says he'll do anything for a million dollars. He heard Jim Cornette, Jim Cornette question the powers of pain cardio. Cornette said he could get if he could last 10 minutes against the powers of pain, they'd run out of gas. And clearly Jim Cornette has never seen these men train in the gym or throw weights around for hours at a time. The Varsity Club versus Dave Spearman and, swear to God, Dark Star. Dark Star. Dark Star was not wearing a mask. or no, fa- just, Not even face paint. He's just a guy. Just a black guy. Yeah, Dark Star. Whose parents said, we will, see, we will name our son Dark. No, that's not what happened, Vinny. He decided that'd be a cool name. I guess so. Or someone came up with an awesome name, Dark Star, but just gave it to a jobber. Yes. I didn't understand Had that. Had on his tights and everything. So I've been really excited about the upcoming Kevin Sullivan, Jimmy Garvin, Prince of Darkness match, the way they've been building it up on oh, TV. I see, yes. They announce here it's a blindfold match. Mm-hmm. I was like, fuck me. Dude, you just killed that. Are we not watching the Crockett Cup? Though? How much of this shit are you going to kill here? A blindfold match? All that great build, and they're going to have a blindfold match. Mm-hmm. I was disgusted. So the jobbers here, here follow the classic wrestling rule that any two random black guys in any promotion must either be teaming with each other or feuding with each other. Steiner was feeling it this evening, tore them apart, pinned Spearman with a German suplex, and Sullivan's got to cut his promo. He's not worried about Jimmy Garvin. He's worried about Dusty Rhodes. He's tried to warn us. Nobody's heeding his warnings, because last week, you recall, he said the Horsemen and Cornette and Paul Jones of the Varsity Club all needed to gang up or they were doomed. The Midnight Rider would pick him off one by one. So what's Dusty, or the Midnight Rider, excuse me, what's the Midnight Rider's one weakness? Uh, as Kevin here explained, it's to help the underdog, to help the poor. I see, I see. So they must exploit this. Yes. Because if they don't all get together and take care of the Midnight Rider, mm-hmm. they will never survive this 120 days. He said the underdog was my patty, with an I, he stressed, which is, of course, precious. Yes. So apparently... Sullivan's plan is to get Precious back, in his mind, get her by his side, and then use her as bait sure, to lure in the Midnight Rider and take him out. Yes. It's the best I can tell. Works for me. Then Jim Ross says, you know, Kevin Sullivan has a point. The Midnight Rider, he's not about wins or losses. He's only about vengeance. It's like, that's not what I got out of that goofy video earlier. <laughs> Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard versus Tony Bowen and Ricky Paradise. The horseman beat him up for a few minutes. How could even this be boring? This was boring. They found a way. Tully won with a slingshot. Arn and Tully have a boring fucking match on this show. Just beating two jobbers. Mm -hmm. So then the horseman cut their promo after the break. And Flair says, you know, I've already got a lot in my mind. Flair's not there. It's JJ. I see JJ. Uh, He's talking about Flair. Uh, I've got a lot in my mind. Rick Flair... I think here was where they first announced will be Rick Flair will be defending the title against Nikita Koloff. Yes, I don't think they revealed that until this week. They they mentioned last week that there'd be like some kind of special opportunity to quote yes. Dario Cueto, uh, that but they never specify what it was. And up to this point, like halfway through the show, they had not announced the world title match for the Crockett Cup tournament. Yeah. So here he casually mentions Rick Flair's defending against Nikita Koloff. He adds that Tully and Arn are chasing a million dollars, so again, he's got a lot in his mind. Now he has been tricked into taking this bull rope match. <laughs> tricked. Tricked. But he, he's, he has a plan. He says, I have no delusions of grandeur. I have serious doubts that I can beat Dusty Rhodes in a bull rope match. Not that he can't. He just doubts it. Serious doubts that he will. Yeah. So, it didn't have to beat him, as you said. I could get one good cowbell shot. I pull that mask off. You're gone for a year, Dusty Rhodes. You can kiss your career goodbye. And Tully and Arn run their mouths for a bit. They're peaking. They're class acts. Nobody gave them a bonus on potential. They earned it on their track record. And then Arn says, we drew money and we put butts in seats and we're going to win the Crockett Cup. So this may be the first time someone talked about, he didn't use this word, but essentially talked about ratings. Eh, kind of. promo, yeah. I believe it's been mentioned before. I'm sure it has. Nikita Koloff versus El Negro. So Koloff left for a while, came back smaller, grew his hair out, mm-hmm. lost 
every ounce of charisma that he had. It's astonishing. And he, he does this match, and it's not even a long match because they don't have him work long matches on TV, but nothing looked good in this match. Everything he did, he's kind of clunky, kind of stumbling around. It just looked terrible here. And I'm like, this is the guy challenging Ric Flair at the Crockett Cup for the world title. He had an elbow and fell down, just laid there in the corner for a while. Yeah. This so, is not good. Does his promo. Said he had talked to Dusty Rose. Dusty's doing very good. He has also talked to the Midnight Rider. And that doesn't say anything about what the Midnight Rider said. Says, I won the Crockett Cup last year. Winning the Crockett Cup again would mean a lot to me. I think by saying that he spoke to Dusty and the Midnight Rider, mm-hmm. the whole point was just... They are two people. They are two men. Yeah. Yes. Winning the Crockett Cup again would mean a lot to him, but something else would mean a lot more. And they had offered him a contract against Ric Flair. Well, of course I signed the contract, he says. And that there's the announcement. That yeah. They, that, that JJ mentioned earlier, and they may have mentioned once or twice, too. After it's been announced, Nikita announces it. This should have opened the show. Why did this not open the show? Well, I guess in storyline, the Crockett Cup's a bigger deal than this world title match. There's a million dollars on the line for a tag team tournament all built around the Crockett family. Flair defends his title all the time. That's true. I guess I guess this was just deemed more important. Hmm. He says, Flair, don't worry about what plane you're going to fly in, what car you're going to drive in, what clothes you're going to wear. He starts taking off his clothes. Everyone goes crazy. Next week, he's beating Flair for the belt. And then we go to a screen that says, coming up, gorgeous Jimmy gets wild. Did it now. That's what it said. I did not write that down or read it. Well. Instead, he had a boring match with Larry Davis, a hideous man. (laughs) It's been a long time since we talked about a hideous jobber, but holy shit, this guy. He's fat. Yeah. He has an atrocious build. It's not even just he's fat. He's fat and horrible looking. I like that he's fat and horrible looking. And his gear was like a black singlet over purple tights. He's got a terrible singlet, lightning bolt. Lightning bolt. Yes. He got a lightning lightning bolt going across his big fat belly. I need something exciting. (laughs) Can you put a lightning bolt on it? I'm going to be the Not a thundercloud. I want the damn lightning bolt. (laughs) This is the most electric belly you ever saw. Yes. And the purple trunk. And it wasn't, by the way. Imagine Grimace from McDonald's, if you remember. Barney. Just the most atrocious color scheme. Mabel. Match was fucking boring. The show is killing me at this point. In the middle of this boring fucking match, they announced that coming up next is Al Perez. I was like, I can't can't take it. So Jimmy went to the Brain Buster. Then he goes to cut his promo, which, as you noted, was when he was going to get wild. He got the most calm, reserved (laughs) promo. He kind of got fired up when he was talking about his wife. I've seen a lot of Jimmy Garvin promos. They're better than this. This That wasn't bad, but... This is going to be the longest six days of his life waiting for this match. There's this thug talking about how patty is his. Says Kevin Sullivan was a sick individual, a wanton, a very wanton individual. Oh, not just wanton, very wanton. Very wanton. Says you can take a man's car and he's going to get angry. You can burn a man's house down. He probably won't like you too much. But you try to take a man's woman and you've crossed the line. He says, just read the newspapers to find out what happens when someone tries to steal another man's wife. And I was like, what heinous crime occurred in April of 1988 involving someone taking another woman, another man's woman? I don't know. He says, uh, talks about the blindfold match. I don't need to see to feel the slime, to smell the stench. It comes off a person like Kevin Sullivan. Fantastics versus Keith Steinborn and Alan Martin. Let's see if I can find out what happened in 1988. I'm not sure which jobber it was that went with the powder blue tights over the white singlet, but you could not have looked any more trailer park than this. It just looked like a guy wearing very tight jeans and a very tight wife beater. With a trailer park physique, I might add. They beat him up for a while. As uh, I think it was Ross who said this, the Fantastics had a lot of team moves. So we got Granny on commentary at one point saying stuff like that. Eventually, they hit, a, they hit a rocket launcher and won. And they say, let's go to the spam slam of the week, which was last week when the Fantastics hit a rocket launcher and won. After the break, the Fantastics are doing a promo. I love, I love that they put their bow tie and tails back on for the promo. <laughs> That's just fantastic. Of course they did. It's fantastic. Why wouldn't they? Gotta look good, man. Yeah, hell yeah. So... 
Fulton's upset about what Cornette has said about his mother. Called her a hag earlier in the show. And he, they cut this fiery promo on Cornette and the Midnight's of the Crocker Cup. A terrible fiery promo. Well, they, they, It was not good. They wrap it up. And there's an awkward pause. And Crockett asks him one more question. And they say like ten more words. And then they storm off. I thought like that must have been the end of the show. And they had to fill more time. No. They just had to fill more time before Al Perez came out. It was very strange. Oh, and then this show. This show had been bad up to this point. Oh. And then this, the last, it was probably only like 10 minutes, but it felt like 30. It actually was more than 10, because when Ricky Santana came out later, there were eight minutes left on the show, because oh I checked. Oh, my God. Yeah, so this was probably a good 12, it was 30. 12 to 15 minutes here. Al Perez and Ryan Wagner. Oh. Al Perez. This was so boring. Like, Later, he made- I was struggling to stay awake. I literally was. Tr- I had to get up. I had to move around. Mm-hmm. This match was killing me. Al's finish, one of his finishes, he hooks a guy for like a razor's edge and then spins him around and lets him go. Fine. So he hits this move, and then usually he either pins them or goes with a spinning toe hold. He hits this big spinning slam and thinking, okay, it's over. And then Al Perez hooks a chin lock. Yeah. He is heel Tim Horner. Finally. Finally, much later, he won with a spinning toe hold. Gary Hart gets a promo after the break. Says he is the only one who has seen Al Perez and Larry Zabisco as a team in action. They've been training for hours, he says, but only I have seen them together. That's, a, that's an advantage for me. No one else has, knows how to prepare for them. And he runs down the Midnight Rider and says, What's your horse's name? Dos Diablos? <laughs> well, we're going to dose your Diablos. Excuse me? I don't think Gary Hart spoke Spanish. I think he did, but that was a funny line. I'm going to steal that. Are you now? Yeah. Good luck. Gary Hart has great delivery, but he's pushing Al Perez in the Crockett Cup. Yeah. They got nothing better for Gary Hart. They don't. Dude. And then fucking Ricky Santana and the Gladiator. Fuck this guy. It's Granny's birthday today. I apologize. I hope she's not listening to this show. I cannot not swear talking about... Ricky Santana. Let me tell you how boring this match was. This match was so goddamn boring, I wasn't the only guy falling asleep. Jim Ross is calling the match. In the middle of the match, he talks about how Ricky Santana performed a maneuver on the Super Destroyer. Who? Yeah. He had no idea who the mask guy was in the ring. And he didn't care. I don't blame him. (laughs) I am not blaming Jim Ross. He could have been the fucking gladiator. He could have been the Super Destroyer. He could have been... What are some of the other goofball mask jobbers they have? Cruel Connection. The Cruel Connection. Conquistadors. The Conquistadors. Anyway. El so. Negro. Fucking could have been anybody. So Ricky's got them in this goddamn arm bar for just days. Ah! Just days. This is the main event of the show. <laughs> the main event of the Go Home Show of the Crockett Cup. A show that was already bad. He does a long arm bar. He does a double wrist lock. I'm like, end this show, please. And at last, and I do mean at last, he goes up top and hits, seriously, the very worst top row splash I ever saw where nobody got hurt. It was so weird. I can't even describe what happened. It was like he jumped and then wanted to go backwards or something. Yeah, it's like halfway through he realized, I don't want to land. I got to turn around. So it's like one. he's coming down like on one leg, which is a great way to break your leg, is, ask, ask Sid. Uh, the other leg's flying out behind him. His arms are, no two of his body parts were on the same plane. Just random flying body through the air. And he pins him. Then he'd cut a promo. At least it was short. Hey, at least his promo was okay. It was acceptable. He is a decent promo. He is a horribly boring... You know what? Maybe he's a great wrestler, but he sure as hell is boring every time he has a squash match. How can you be boring during a squash match? I don't know. If I could live my life only doing squash matches... That would be the goal. I'd be the happiest guy in the world, and they would not be boring. These fucking guys go out here and do the most boring-ass squash matches. He cuts his promo trying to get me interested in the Crockett Cup. And his team with, what is he, Shane Douglas? I think so. I think it's Shane Douglas because the other team was the hideously boring Al Perez and Larry Zabisco. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine the stalling in those matches. Yeah. This absolutely brutalized any interest that I had in the Crockett Cup. 
and I was so massively depressed when the show was over. It was a horrible show. If this limps along like this for the next six months, I don't know what we're going to do, Vinny. I can't take this and Russo Nitros at the same time. <laughs> That's And fair. Raw. That's fair. This was bad. Bad, bad, bad. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. There you go. I, I held that so Rob could cut to me. Thank you. Thumbs down. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. <laughs> so the story of this here NWA World Championship Wrestling Show, uh, the date I gave you, April 23rd, is when it aired, which was actually basically head-to-head with one of the Crockett Cup shows. Yeah. Now, it was actually taped a couple of days beforehand, which becomes very important, as we shall get into here. What day was this? The 22nd? 23rd. 23rd? So, okay, so there was a TV taping on the 20th. It was probably this one. Which was this one. Yeah. And then the Crockett Cup spanned two days. Yes. So I would guess that the Crockett Cup finale was taking place head to head. I believe I believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it opened with clips of uh Which is funny though, because well I guess the announcers it, weren't if you were really, really paying attention in nineteen eighty eight and you were a wrestling fan, you would think to yourself, Boy, these guys wrapped up all the events of this show very quickly and then went from Jacksonville to the Carolinas in about an hour and did a whole other show. Sure, but my point is, like, if you have the announcer saying that people are lined up for the Crockett Cup, mm-hmm. then as a fan, if it's the second night of the Crockett Cup, you're asking yourself, well, why don't we have any results on this show of the first night that, of the Crockett that's Cup? That's also a good point. So maybe it was the first night. Yeah. What the point of this is, it doesn't fucking matter. No. We didn't hear a goddamn thing about the Crockett Cup on this show. No. So it opened with clips of Tully Blanchard, I guess it was just in a squash match. He was outside brawling with somebody when J.J. Dillon frantically jumps in the apron to get his attention because there was a horse in the building. Yeah, a horse did a run-in. Specifically, the Midnight Riders horse, Dos Diablos. Yep. So Tully and uh, J.J., are their eyes are now focused on the horse, but it is a, a Trojan horse, in fact, because... Uh, Very good, Vinny. Yeah, I just thought of that. Excellent. That, that's a, it's a trap. Uh the Midnight Rider, I don't know why I said Dusty. The Midnight Rider did not come out of the horse, but he came through the crowd on the other side of the ring. And as promised, he is the ultra-violent version of Dusty Rhodes, because he pulls out a noose and ties Hold him. on, hold on, Vinny. Let, 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 let's go into some detail on this. Right. Everybody knows what a noose is. I believe so. You get some rope, you tie a loop, mm-hmm. you tie some gimmicks around it or whatever, other loops. Anyway, it's a circle. It goes around your neck, and right? it kills you, yes. Okay. Yeah. So... The Midnight Rider comes out with a gimmick noose. He holds the rope up, and the noose is completely rigid in a circle. Okay. (laughs) Like he's holding up like a basketball hoop. A hula hoop, yeah. Yeah. And he slowly puts it over the head. Like, I guess it was amazing. It's supposed to be like a Western, where like you're thinking of the guy going like this, and you see the thing fly. Like a a lasso. Exactly. But because it's professional wrestling and everything has to be slow, he has a rigid noose. Like a halo, basically. It was amazing. It literally was like a halo if you broke your neck. He slowly brings the halo up and puts it over the neck. And, like, Tully's just standing there. Like and this thing goes, like Darth Vader's helmet over his head. Kind of. And finally it gets around his neck, and then Dusty grabs him, and he wraps the rest of it around his neck. Yes. Jim Ross is screaming that he's hanging him, even though he's laying on the mat. It's very dramatic. It was very dramatic. Very corny. All of that is true. So as noted from the Jacksonville Coliseum here, and uh, it, it was odd that they're, they're pretending the show is live and just going on before the Crockett Cup, and yet so many guys from the show were on the Crockett Cup, including the tag champs and their top challengers. Weird how that works. It's amazing. Sting versus David Isley went 60 seconds, maybe less. Sting does a promo, says he has a project can going. We, can we note that in the 60-second squash match of David Isley... Sting still had to miss a, f- a flying elbow. I don't know why. I guess we could just stand up and not sell it. I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. One minute. Yeah. So, in the middle of Sting's promo, he realizes David Crockett's holding the microphone too low. So, he says, hold this up here so I don't have to bend over. David Crockett's been doing this a long time. <laughs> a long time. Every day. Yeah. Every day. Your shoulders get tired. I guess so. So, Sting says his new project is he wants a 60-minute match with Ric Flair. We'll get three judges again. We'll put J.J. in a cage again. That's his new project. And then he says, bye-bye, and he leaves. I loved that Sting doesn't come out and say I have a new goal. We went 45, now I want to go 60. 
get some new judges. Comes out and says, I got a project. Yeah. They're just going to talk about something he was doing in his garage. Woodworking. Yeah. Instead, it was a match with Ric Flair. JJ in a cage again. He was very charismatic. Oh, that's for sure. Yes. That is for sure. Midnight Rider in action, they promised. And this is, I believe, from another arena. So they cut to a wide shot. The, 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 the rider's doing his entrance. He's on his horse. Magnum's on his side. And they cut to the ring. And there's been no intros. There's been no graphics. We don't know who he's going to be wrestling. We just know he's in action. They cut to the ring. And I swear to God, it's Scott Norton with a chair. And we've made this joke now for like a month. But it really is true. It's Bear Collie. Who looks like Scott, Nor- Scott Norton? Yes, especially when they do the wide shot and you can see the whole arena. Yes, Big Bear Collie. So Big Bear Collie has armed himself with a steel chair for this Midnight Rider match. It backfired. <laughs> he swings the chair over his head, and the rider dodges. And what I've seen a hundred times, where I thought would happen here, is the chair would hit the ropes and bounce back and hit Collie in the face. It, it's Big Bear Collie. It's Big Bear Collie. So it hits the ropes and instead goes bouncing high up into the air and backwards over his head. Midnight Rider does a dust, bunch of Dusty Road spots, the bionic elbow, and the DDT on the chair for the win. Never even took his trench coat off, his duster. Well, he wrestled for 15 seconds. That's, I mean, that's true. what are you expecting? So, the Rider retreats to a corner as the Geek Crew comes out to scrape the body of Big Bear Collie off the mat. Outside, Magnum TA is cutting this ultra-serious promo about how much trouble there's going to be how the the writer's here, how dangerous he is. He's got a cowboy hat, his own duster. Mm, he got his own, yeah, he's got his own, own, own uh, uniform, you yes. can say. And, and, and he's deathly serious. This is all bad news. And uh, Ross says something about trying to get a word with the writer. And at this point, the Midnight Rider snaps. He kills all the geeks, tosses them all out of the ring. Yep. Place is going absolutely crazy People for just this. losing their shit. Yes. Finally, the Midnight Rider allows Jim Ross to come into the ring and interview him without uh, killing him. Do you know, Brian, that the Midnight Rider does a great Dusty Rhodes impression? Hey, all I got to say is people were very critical of Dusty at this time. And why is it all built around Dusty and got to push these new guys? And obviously, that's what should have happened. But man, this fucking guy was over. (laughs) He sure was. He was so over in the ring. He was so over on his promo. Everything he said, the place just goes crazy. They were so into this guy. He promised violence, violence, violence. Yes. Coming to the horsemen. The Fantastics versus Kerry Stevens and Snake Watson. Excuse me, did you say Snake Watson? Snake Watson. Okay. So, which of these fat fucking guys was Snake? Don't know. Okay. (laughs) Why was he a snake? Don't know. I saw Snake Watson and I thought, okay, like skinny guy, you know? Yeah. There was no skinny guy in this ring. No. There was one big fat guy. And there was another fat guy who was hairy. <laughs> Neither of these men looked like a snake. No, so snakes. There was a bald, hairy guy. Yeah. Know, which I, snakes are hairless. Yeah. Last time I checked. So I don't think that was snake. I'm assuming the other guy was snake. He was very fat. Yeah. I don't know if he just ate ten mice. This match was terrible. So the Fantastics hug out as part of their entrance. They come out and they high five every single fan in the front row who runs up to them, and the ladies get a hug and sometimes a kiss. And 99% of the women are very excited about this. Today, they met the one percenter. Mm. And as they, are, as they are going around smiling, high-fiving, hugging, and kissing, I look up, and there's a woman who is rubbing the side of her face and scowling. She did not think it was going to happen. She did not approve. She was, she was surely holding out hope for the nature boy later tonight. I guess so. Yeah. so this match was just... The, the fans were so into the Fantastics. The match starts, they're going totally crazy. I don't know like where this was filmed as compared to everything else, but I'm pretty sure the people were expecting that the Fantastics were going to squash Snake Watson and Kerry Stevens. You're underestimating Kerry Stevens. Instead, they just wrestled and wrestled and wrestled, and sure enough, crowd died. They were dead for the second half of this match until they hit that rocket launcher. What I got out of this match was actually nothing that happened in the ring. It was what they were talking about on commentary, because... The angle here between the Fantastics and Midnight's it heated up when, after the Clash match, when Cornette took off his belt and they began to whip the Fantastics. Yes. And I assumed that this was going to lead to some kind of double strap match or something. No. They had a much better idea. A much better idea. The Fantastics and Midnight's are going around the horn with the loser gets ten lashes stip. Yes. 
So if the Fantastics lose, as they would later say in their promo, they will be a man and they will take 10 lashes from the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. 10 each, 10 apiece. But if they win, Stan Lane gets 10 lashes, Bobby Eaton gets 10 lashes, and as the announcers say here, Jim Cornette will also get 10 lashes. Which, by the way, we learn shortly thereafter, nobody informed Jim no. Cornette that <laughs> so, he also would get 10 lashes. Someone was left in the dark. So yes, this went way too long. The Fantastics won with the, Midnight, uh, with the uh, rocket launcher. And then they did their promo, plugging the upcoming uh, 10 lashes match. Steve Williams versus Bob Riddle. Riddle's a, Riddle's a big dude, about as uh, tall as Doc, and not quite as thick, but certainly not skinny. Williams presses him over his head and then begins to run in place. Oh, yeah. He's a big, big, scary man. Crowd went nuts for this squash match. I, yeah, I went nuts here 30 years later. It was, it was about a minute long, and Dr. Death gave him the Oklahoma Stampede. Mm-hmm. Everybody loved every second of it. Yeah. And then he cut a badass promo threatening Ric Flair. Says, we're going to find out what kind of man you are and what kind of machine I am. And yes, he's coming for the NWA World Heavyweight title at some point. And if I was Ric Flair, I would have walked out and handed him the belt and walked away. Mm. He was terrifying. The Midnight Express versus Tommy Angel and Rocky King. So this was a match where Cornette was informed. But before we even get to that, the match is going on, and they keep throwing ge- geeks outside so Cornette can whip them and giggle. Sure. Whip them and giggle. But the point of this is Cornette's alerted here, and it's Jim Cornette. So when Jim Cornette is alerted that if his team loses, he also will get whipped. Mm-hmm. He lost his shit. I know I use that phrase a lot, but he lost his shit like I've never hear, heard him lose his shit on this show before. Voice going so high, screaming. They could tear me to ribbons! In an That's absolute, not fair! He's in an absolute panic. And, of course, the Midnights know that this is what's happening here in this match. So, they go out there and they have a long match <laughs> with Tommy Angel and Rocky <laughs> King. They give Cornette plenty of time to lose his shit. <laughs> And it was great, unlike the Fantastics, because they gave Tommy Angel and Rocky King some stuff, and Tommy Angel fucking sucks, but the Midnight Express are great, and so they actually made him look competent, and then Rocky King's pretty good, and they did a bunch of stuff for him, and then they cut him off and beat him up and hit the rocket launcher, and this was an excellent segment. Everybody was great. It's so great because everything Cornette did before joining the commentators set up everything that happened when he joined the commentators. Yes. Uh, when he whipped the geeks and they got thrown outside and laughed. So you, you already have it in your mind that you like to see the skinny little bastard get whipped. He also, at one point, held up the U.S. tag titles and said, One year! We have been tag team, U.S. tag team champions for one year. So when he goes to join the announce desk, he's talking about how great it's going to be whipping Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton. They tell him he's going to whip, get whipped too. He panics. He's terrified. He screams and he wails. He starts talking about how there's nothing they can do to make me show up. They can sue me. I don't care. I won't go. They say, well, if you don't show up, Jim, your men can be stripped of those U.S. tag team titles. He says, they can't do that. We've been champions for a year. Ah! So great. Then at the end, just just right before the end of the match, his fear finally turned to rage. Started talking about how you, they, because the Fantastics, Fantastics had put him in danger, now they were going to get beat up even more. Oh, So that worked out well. Yeah, this is awesome. It's one of those things where that's the kind of thing that sells tickets. If you buy a ticket, you may get to see Jim Cornette get whipped ten times by that strap. And then during the match, you're going to care who wins. Yes. Because you want to see Cornette get whipped. Yes. So you're going to cheer passionately. Old school, basic pro wrestling that always works. Ric Flair promo. Every Flair promo you ever heard. All the women love him. He said... Sting wants a 60-minute match, but he should ask these women. I'm the 60-minute man. I could not possibly care less about your, your stipulation here. Yeah, no. Says Dr. Death might be tough, but the women I know, they want a man who dresses well in a suit and tie, all cleaned up, driving a limo. And he says, this is going to be my century. <laughs> and looking back at the 20th century, <laughs> you could argue that it was, in fact, Ric Flair's century. He has, he has, a, sta- he has a, a claim. He has a very good claim, actually. Yes. One of the better ones. And he does, in fact, dress better than Steve Williams. Yes. That is also true. David Crockett marking out, just having the time of his life being in the presence of the nature boy. Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff versus Max MacGyver and Bob Emery and Curtis Thompson. 
What a weird ass match. Yeah, just the six man tag champs and three random geeks. Well, it was weird because you got the Warlord and the Barbarian. You mentioned, Vinny, as this was going on as we were watching it live. Ivan Koloff won with a leg drop. Yes. Yeah. He, did, yes. he did the leg drop of Doom. Mm-hmm. That was a finish. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that's kind of weird. And they show a replay, and the Warlord and the Barbarian are hitting every combo power terrifying move you've ever seen like one guy's got a guy up in a suplex yeah, and like the, the barbarian comes off top with a high cross and they all crash and burn like the, a train wreck the, the midnight rockers used to use this move yes the powers of pain do the exact same thing here barbarian lands on the guy with uh, the high cross and he bounces high in the air you can see on his face this hurt the barbarian badly and, and that, that wasn't a finish ivan just drops a big leg ivan drops a leg and that's the end i i guess i don't know so my memory of the Warlord, even when after he jumps to WWE... Is he was bad? He was horrible. Yes. Now, we started watching him here, and at first he was horrible. Then he improved to being boring, and now he's, like, totally competent. Does I don't know get, if I'd go quite that far. Does he get much worse? Um, I think he was... Does he, he just decline rapidly, he, or am I, am I just... I, th- I think that you gave him too much credit in this match. I may have. I mean, he was in there with Ivan. Yep. And the Barbarian. And the Barbarian, who are both and awesome. three jobbers that all he had to do was throw around. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember him but it, it's not just a escalating one thing. and then falling. It's a one-night thing, because I've I, I had the same thought in prior Powers of Pain matches. That well, maybe, maybe you should watch some of his WWF Maybe stuff. I will go watch some of that. Maybe he's, and, maybe he's better than you remember. Yeah, that may be it, too. Jimmy Garvin promo. So, by this point, the Prince of Darkness match had already taken place. Yes. And it was, in fact... Fucking terrible. <laughs> they, I, I, I haven't seen the match, but apparently they're both blindfolded. Yeah. They both stumble past each other multiple times, and then Garvin rolls him up and pins him. Sweet. That's the payoff to that's this his, fucking awesome feud. That's his that revenge. Him and Sullivan had. <laughs> this is the match we are all to fear, this Prince of Darkness match. They Prince, fucking put a blindfold on and stumble around like idiots. Prince of Darkness death match. Death match. Mm. Fuck, no wonder they sold so, and Garvin's out there with this promo. It's an awesome promo. Yeah, when he's ranting about the crime in L.A. compared to Beirut. Okay, that, I, I, he lost. What me was there. he fucking talking about? He lost me on that line. That's true. But he said, "How can I be in a bad mood with such a pretty thing standing next to me?" And it's all because of the black cloud known as Kevin Sullivan. He tried to hurt my brother Ronnie. What he tried to do to my squeeze is insane. I can't guarantee I'm going to win every match, but you try to kidnap my woman, you try to hurt my brother, you try to mess with my family, I'm going to get you! You got another thing coming. Yes. That was a great promo. It was a great promo. It's like you watched that Donald Cerrone promo last night from the UFC show. It was the same promo, basically. He's going to get you? No, he, he literally brought his four-month-old child into the ring. Oh, okay. And he, he virtually cut the same promo. He goes... Everyone says a child changes you, but it's true. And I stepped in the ring tonight, and I thought, you ain't taking food off my child's table. He armbarred the guy and broke his arm in the first round. Oh. It was awesome. He was the best. Was it was his first baby? I believe so, yes. There was somebody. I forget who it was. There and for the first time in UFC history. A four-month-old was in the ring? Like, in my mind, they threw the baby to the octagon, but they didn't. They actually brought the baby in. Yeah. But, like, he's got the baby. And, you know, like, a lot of times people win and the family comes in the ring and they hug the baby or whatever. He hugs the baby and then he won't give the baby back. And they go to commercial and they come back. And the first thing you see is Donald Cerrone standing here with a baby in his arms. And they announce him the winner. Sweet. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> I haven't either. And he's holding with this arm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is the ref going to raise his arm and, like, the baby's going to fall on the ground? Or, like, what's going to happen here? And the ref just pats him on the back. <laughs> was awesome <laughs> that's tremendous yeah there was a fighting show in the tacoma dome many years ago and somebody a ufc veteran i, th- I thought it was throwing but maybe not but he he wins his fight in the main event and they his kids come in the ring and they, they're they're interviewing him over the house mic and they say hey i see you got your kids there are they gonna join you in the cage someday the fighter says god i hope not <laughs> yeah all of this is more exciting than al perez versus larry stevens I, all I wrote, all I wrote about the match was nothing happens and Al wins with a toehold. Yeah. Uh, on and com- all they do is talk about Al Perez, future U.S. champion. Al Perez. They're doing because He's Dusty. It. I'm like, dude, Al Perez? 
I mean, they got to try. They're, they're, no, there's a million guys they can put the U.S. title on. They don't have to. The announcers have to try to put over the talent that's in front of them. You're right, but yeah. th- like, there's a reason they're pushing him. Because like he may be the next U.S. champion. I forget. But like clearly they're pushing this guy. He's on every fucking show beating somebody. So yes, Dusty Rhodes is suspended, so they have stripped him of the U.S. title. There's going to be a tournament coming up, and they're also pushing Al Perez versus Nikita Koloff. Anyway. Uh, yeah, then Gary Hart cuts a promo. They talk about the tournament some. Uh, Gary promises they will not only beat the Midnight Rider, but unmask him as well. He says, we're going to prove it's Dusty Rhodes. We're going to prove he's nothing but a ripoff. And if you believe in him, then you are ripoff too. David Crockett says, no. And Gary says, yes. I'm not making that up. I loved it. That actually happened. So apparently he didn't, he didn't win the U.S. title. Thank God. But then he went to Dusty's promotion and immediately won the PWF world title. Oh, a world champion. I think it was a world champion of the PWF. Which I'm almost positive was the Pro Wrestling Federation. Might have been. Nikita Koloff versus... I guess it would be the Florida heavyweight title. It wasn't the world title. Nikita Koloff versus, as Tony Schiavone pronounced it, Crusher (laughs) Knault. How would you pronounce it? K-N-A-U-L-T. I'm looking at it. I would assume a silent K. Crusher Knault? Crusher Knault. Well, he put a K for Crusher. He did. So I presume I, did I, there's a Crusher. point to the K in the second. Crusher K- Knault. K-N-A-U-L-T. Knault. Yes. He looked like the dirty white boy, except dirtier and whiter. Nikita pinned him with a sickle. Nikita is so small now. Like, he loses 10 pounds a week at this point. He's so small. He looks like he should be on 205 Live at this point. Am I the only one? I think so, yeah. Exaggerating it a tad. And then... One of the most famous moments, segments at least, in the history of this promotion. Barry Windham and Lex Luger versus Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson for the World World Tag Team Championships. I love how they said this up on TV, too. They're just... I didn't even know they build this at the beginning of the show. Did they talk about this at the very beginning of the show? They said the World Tag Team Champions would be on the show. Okay. I don't even think they said it was a title match. So they... They certainly didn't say it was a title match against these dudes. No, like, like randomly, an hour into the show, maybe a little less, they say, coming up next... Lex Luger and Barry Windham will be defending the World Tag Team titles against Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson. And I was like, oh my God, like, this is the match. Yeah. They're, they're just randomly throwing it on the show here. See, I, I, I thought that the, the, what happens here happened a little bit later. So something would happen here to set up what happens. But no, it happens on this show. No, this is it. This is it. It was weird. So, they, first, first of all, they had a great tag team match. Sure did. 20 plus minutes, multiple heat segments, but they had enough time to make it all work. There was so much subtle stuff early. They would go back and forth, but at the end of each back and forth, the baby faces would come out on top one way or another. Of course they would. And the, the, the heels would always try, uh, one of them had Tully by the arm, and they're like arm ringers, and Tully reaches for a tag and gets yanked back down onto his back. The heels always bonk into each other. Just great, great, great stuff. And then finally, how do they finally take over? How do they finally get the advantage on these men? An eye rake by the illegal man. Yes. That is awesome. Yes, because they're heels. Yes. Barry Windham was booked as a superhero in this match. <laughs> yes. This was not a deal where, well, you know, Barry's turning, so we'll keep on the apron the entire time, and then we'll do a horseman beatdown or whatever. The story of this match, as we later find out, is apparently J.J. had communicated with Wyndham that Luger Luger is all about himself. He won't be there. And there will come a time where you need him and he's not going to be there. Yes. But Barry Wyndham is, at the beginning of this match, he's still a babyface. Oh, yeah. He's not going in there with the intention of turning on Lex Luger. Yeah. He goes in there. He's with, gonna fight with his friend to defend the world tag yep, titles. And he, he works as a baby face. In the back of his mind, he remembers what he has been told by JJ, but he doesn't want to believe it. And so he fights and he's a hero. And he beats the shit out of the horseman. He sure did. And he tags his partner. And so finally, yes, they they go to work on For first, Barry. First first they cut they cut Barry off first. Yep. Maybe five minutes or so they work him over. Barry gets the hot tag to Lex. Yep. Lex runs wild, but he makes a, a, the, the, the inexperienced mistake of going for the torture rack too early, which leaves him exposed, and Arn kicks him in the knee. 
Yes. And now he is cut off, and now the real heat segment begins. And they're tearing Lex apart for a long, long time. And he's fighting for the tag, and he can't get it. He's fighting for the tag, and he can't get it. Now, a, a, a point of this, every time that he fights for the tag, and he doesn't get it. They they cut to a shot of Wyndham, and at first he's he's upset that he missed the tag. He's upset at himself or whatever. But as time goes on, you can see that he is getting frustrated with Lex. Yes. Why can't you fucking get over here, dude? Yes. Get over here and tag me. Yes. So finally, Lex is on his feet and stumbling over to the corner. Tully hits him with a knee to the back that sends him out of the ring. But on his way out of the ring, he's able to tag Barry in. So now Barry runs wild. But as Barry is in the ring destroying Arn, Tully is on the floor destroying Lex. And he throws him into the post. And Jim Ross says, that sounded like a gunshot. You know, this was a big match when Luger bladed. Luger comes up. Yeah, actually. Yep. <laughs> I thought of that. But Luger comes up bleeding. And Jim Ross, there's, there's a gravity, as Jim Ross says. Oh, no. Yes. So Lex is destroyed. Lex is clinging to life, barely, on the floor. He's not moving. He's not moving. So Barry is holding his own two-on-one against the horseman. Eventually, he's cut off. But he keeps coming back. And he goes to the corner where he has no partner. And every time he has no partner, J.J. is there to point and say, I told you, Wyndham, I told you he wouldn't be there when you needed him. And by the end, after two or three times of this, Barry is like in on the joke. He knows when he goes to his partner, Lex won't be there. So like he goes backwards and holds up his hand and a tag never comes. So he just goes in the ring and keeps fighting. Minutes go on of this. Finally, a beaten, broken, bloody Lex Luger drags himself up in the apron up in the corner. And Wyndham just looks at him with disgust and disdain of what a failure this man is. And he walks over. <laughs> Remember when uh, somebody was in a tag team with Buddy Wayne? Yes. And they tagged his hands so hard that Buddy was almost wanted to leave? Yes. That's what Barry did to Lex here. He tagged his hand as hard as he possibly could. And then he picked him up, and he slammed him over the ropes into the ring. Crowd is shocked. Crowd is gasping and screaming. Potato chips fly into the ring. They don't know what to do. <laughs> there was something that flew in. It was potato chips. The horsemen, they've been beaten up by Barry at this point. They're, they're down in the corner on their hands and knees just watching. They don't know what's going on. And Lex is standing in the middle of the ring soaking up all the booze. Or say Barry standing in the middle of the ring soaking up all the booze. Lex is pulling himself up to his feet by dragging himself up Barry's body. And finally, it's a struggle, but he makes it up to his feet and Barry just grabs him and then runs and hits the ropes. Larry hits his damn head off, and he holds up four fingers, and he makes his exit. The horsemen are beside themselves. They can't believe their good fortune. They can't believe this is all happened. And they, once the shock wears off, they jump on Lex, and they pin him, and they're world champions again. So it sounds to me like J.J. negotiated with Wyndham, or at least spoke to Wyndham, but he did not fill in the rest of the horsemen. Apparently not. They're baffled by they, what's going on. They, 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 they were caught totally off guard. But man, they're accepting it. Oh, They'll sure. take it. They'll take it, absolutely. Because they had enough on their minds. They had a whole Crockett Cup tournament to focus on. You, to, JJ didn't need to distract them with what, what he didn't even know would work. Just an idea he had. So I got to talk about the post-match. because. It was, oh, yes, we do. It was excellent. It's even better, actually. So they're all heading backstage. Jones, Pat, and Wyndham on the back. The Midnight Rider comes out. And he hits the ring to tend to Lex. People are throwing shit into the ring. Sting comes out. Dr. Death comes out. Nikita. I was going to say Noam Dar, but I guess it was Nikita Koloff. So the writer, he just, he cannot believe what he's seen. Now we got to go back a little bit here and recall that Dusty has been suspended. Yes. The Midnight Rider showed up. Mm -hmm. J.J. Dillon is certain that the Midnight Rider has to be Dusty Rhodes. As are Gary Hart, Kevin Sullivan, Everybody, and Jim Cornette. Yeah. So last week there was the interview with J.J. Dillon and Jim Crockett Jr. And Jim Crockett, he doesn't believe it's Dusty Rhodes. And so the agreement is if they can unmask this man mm -hmm. and get and, a camera and prove that he is Dusty Rhodes... Mm -hmm. Dusty will be suspended not for three months or whatever, but for a full year. Yeah. That could be the end of his career. Sure could. I've heard before. Yeah. So, knowing that, the Midnight Rider storms backstage. He's so angry. He's so furious. Mm -hmm. He goes into the locker room, and for a moment, he almost takes his mask off. 
because he wants Wyndham to know who's talking to him. But then he remembers that he can. He he goes in. It's the heel locker room. They're all the there. The horsemen are there. The varsity club's in there. I think the, the men express were definitely in there. Every heel. And they're all just so stunned to see him. They yeah. all just stand up and look. Like, what the hell is this guy doing in here? And Barry gets in the Midnight Rider's face. Says, I got nothing to say to you. And that, that, that was where the writer almost teased taking his mask off. Well, the point of all of this is... Mm-hmm. If this were WWE, I don't even know what they would do, but they'd fuck something up. Nothing, nothing because, like Because this. there's no logic in whatever they do. There's no friends in WWE, so all the heels would be handled. That's, that's true. That's one thing. But the point of this is, when he walks in there, at first they're stunned, mm-hmm. but then every single heel realizes, i got to take this fucking guy's mask yes. off. Yes! And they all jump him. They all start tearing at his mask. You can hear shouts. But literally, one of the problems is, there's so many of them. Yeah. That there's bodies all over the place. Yes. You can't see anything. Right. Then the baby faces run in, and they leap on the Midnight Rider. The mask is off. You could see the blonde, curly hair. They established the Midnight Rider is a blonde man. He is definitely a blonde. Mm-hmm. And they're dragging him away. And as they're dragging him away, the heels are screaming at the cameraman. Get his face! Get his face! They're, they're pushing the cameraman at the guy. The, the baby faces all drag him off. You never see his face. No. But the point of this is, this all made... Absolute, perfect sense. Every single person involved in this. Mm-hmm. There was not one person that did something nonsensical. No. I mean, Dusty, he was an idiot. His emotions got the better his of emo- him. His but- giant Texas-sized heart, as, Jay, as, uh, as Sullivan says, got the best of him. Yes. But man, it was such a great angle. So, they let, before the violence broke out, as the writer promised, little did he know, it would not go his way, but... The writer and Wyndham had their face to face. And Wyndham says, I got nothing to say to you. And he starts to walk away. That's when the writer really gets mad. Don't turn your back on me. And I believe if you go back, I'm pretty sure the writer actually threw the first punch. Probably did. Dusty's crazy. And then they all, then, then as you noted, they all swarm him and there's everyone shouting, get the hood, get his mask, get his face, damn it. And eventually they, they, they covered him up and took him away, and the camera could not follow as much to the fury of J.J. Dillon. Mm. This incompetent cameraman. Which fucking Crockett was this? All he had to do was follow these baby faces who couldn't go full speed because they had to protect Dusty's face. They go to a pro- uh, commercial, and they come back, and the varsity clubs at ringside. For One of the these promo. Crockett's was a cameraman. I'm almost positive. Jackie Crockett. Mm. It's a fucking conspiracy. You don't say. <laughs> yeah, one of these fucking Crockett's was unable to get Dusty's face. That's what happened here. We need to get him on the show and defend himself. I'm going to find out. God damn it. So there's a Sullivan promo after the break. And listen, every, this is what, what just happened was enormous. The, the last 20, well, kind of the match, like 40 minutes of TV is a, a nuclear bomb on a show that basically nothing ever happens. They just got promos on each other. You had a major turn. By a guy who who is a legit ma- uh, ba- main event babyface for the past several years. Yep. Uh, he, uh, and, and turns, this is not the big show, where every three months they turn for no reason. Turns didn't happen very often back then, and when they did it was important. So you had a major turn of a major hero. You had a world tag team title championship change, mm. when that was major news. You had the real top guy almost get exposed and suspended for a whole year. So much happened in this past not even an hour of TV. Just, everyone's suddenly just exhausted. So Sullivan's got this promo. He, of course, is hey, he's happy about what went, what went on, but you know, he also knows it's very serious. There's nothing to joke about. He says, Barry was more than just a friend. Barry was Dusty's son, and he just crossed the line. There's a very clear line in this business. And Barry Winner has crossed that line. He's kept you in his shadow too long, Barry. He's held you down. As for Dusty, he says, even your son knows the darkness. It's a hard, cruel world, he says, and there's never a happy ending. Mm. So a match has to happen. I guess. <laughs> no one cared about Mike Rotunda versus Sam Bass. This match didn't need to happen. It did not need because to happen. The last, I don't know, 10 minutes of the show, maybe less, mm-hmm. was a replay of the angle and the turn and everything. Yeah. Why the fuck can you just air that again instead of this Mike Rotundo, Sam Bass, bullshit, fucking boring, going on fucking forever bullshit match? You actually left the room during the highlight of this, which is when... Ro- there was no highlight. No, there was. There was. 
Rotunda, the highlight was Rotunda whipped him across the corner. Bass stumbled running the corner, went head first into the buckle and legit almost broke his neck. That was the highlight. Eventually, and by which I mean like an hour in, Rotunda hit a uh, Samoan drop, which they called a, I'm pretty sure they called a back over suplex. A back over suplex for the win. And then we end with like a minute of great television. The horsemen, things have settled down. They've all taken showers. They've all gotten cleaned up. They're at the limo. They present Wyndham with this horseman jacket. Oh, look at that. It's a perfect fit. And they, they all get in the limo. They're talking about going to party. And Wyndham is the last man to join the limo or to, to enter the limo. He slams the door shut. And for a few seconds, the camera's just focused on this shut limo door. And I thought it was fade to black, but no, it gets even better. The window rolls down. And Barry is there holding the Midnight Riders mask and smiling. What a dick. It was awesome. What a fucking dick. It was awesome. This show ruled. This was a fabulous show. I have been looking forward to this really since we first started watching. Really? These old Saturday night shows. That long? Did it hold up? Oh, God, yes. It was everything it you was, imagined. It was worth the wait. Yeah, it's even better now, actually. When you're a little kid, it's just like, oh, my God, I can't believe what happened. Well, I got and you get older and you start to figure things out and you understand wrestling. You realize that was one of the great angles of all time. I, I got to break this news for my cousin at a pool party. Barry Windham joined the Four Horsemen. Oh, wow. And he wanted to leave that party and go home and check. <laughs> he had to go home and check? He didn't believe you? Well, let's see it for his own eyes. Oh, Vinny's fucking with me again. I never know. No way Wyndham could have possibly turned. <laughs> and there will be gorilla shit all over the army. <laughs> NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 30th, 1988. We have a brief clip of a J.J. Dillon interview. There's a much longer version of this. That must have played on one of the other shows that unfortunately was not on this one. But this is a brief clip saying J.J. Uh, JJ, J.J. says there have been changes in the Four Horsemen. There have always been changes, but no matter what changes were made, the Four Horsemen always dominated. dominated. And now they have signed Barry Windham. They have Tully and Arn as tag team champions defending against all challengers. Ric Flair is the world champion also defending against all challengers. And soon Barry Windham will win that tournament and claim the vacant U.S. title. It was an awesomely pompous J.J. Dillon promo. Basically, actually the show opened, we had this, and then we had the announcers telling us that Luger's going to discuss how he felt when he was beaten up by Barry Windham. They announced that Luger and Sting had won the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup Tournament, which, by the way, I don't think we saw any footage no. of. No. Well, uh, briefly, but th they announced it here with all th all the passion and energy that you just had, and uh, it was almost never meant. It was never mentioned again in the show. The win, yes, yeah. So they they could not have made a smaller deal out of this tournament win by the surprise team. That was not even a team going into the event. Yes, and the Fantastics, the new NWA Tag Team Champions. U.S. Tag Team Champions. U.S. Champions. And the Midnight Rider is going to be here this week. And so, basically, I mean, they they it was a hell of a week. A lot happened. That is true. That is true. And we, out of all that excitement, the new champions, the new team, a major turn, the Midnight Rider, we begin with Al Perez and George South. It wasn't terrible. It didn't go that long. But the most exciting in this thing, Matt, uh, the most exciting thing in this match is when Al, whose finish is the spinning toe hold, switched things up and used a spinning arm hold. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, that didn't work. So he used the spinning toe hold and he won. Boring which match. Was a, it was a boring match, but it led to something great, which is Gary Hart. Gary Hart and Al Perez cut a promo. So there's, there's, there's three stages to this promo. The first is Gary Hart plugging the U.S. title tournament show. And this was the first time I've ever seen Gary Hart cutting a babyface promo. And it was a total babyface promo. Talks about all the other surrounding communities of Houston, Beaumont, all the other places that I don't know because I'm not from Houston, but everyone who has a car or a bus or a plane and can get to that building needs to get to that building. You're going to see one of the greatest wrestling events you're ever going to see in your life, and I know all the Latin people in that part of the world, they're going to support Al Perez. They're going to come and cheer Al Perez. It's this great babyface promo. Al says something in Spanish very quickly, and then the last phase of the promo is Gary Hart reverting to his true form, a dirty low-life heel. He says, it's downright shame that a Texan like Dusty Rhodes is going to appear at this event as the Midnight Rider. At this point, David Crockett pulls back pulls back the mic and says, well, you don't know that's him. 
Gary says, if that's not Dusty Rhodes, I'll go to the top of the Astrodome and jump off head first. <laughs> that's what he said. It was so awesome. You know, when Gary Hart first came in, it was like, he started, and it was all right, but it, like, wasn't great. It's kind of like, he's good, but, like, there's so many good promos here, and he's just, like, he's fine, but, like, the legendary Gary Hart, he's just not doing it for me. But the more that I that I see of Gary Hart in the show, he's he's totally different from everybody. He never raises his voice. Yes. He's always very, very calm. He... It's just, I don't know. Like, the more we, I watch we, him, the more I realize this guy is awesome. Well, we've been watching this show for a couple of years now. We've seen Jim Cornette, who talks a million miles an hour. We've seen Ric Flair, who almost basically has one promo, but it's always awesome. We have seen Paul Jones just make a big screaming fool out of himself for years. We've seen Dusty Rhodes maybe this weird, scary clown or whatever Dusty Rhodes was at this point. But we then you have Gary Hart, who's just a believable man. Yeah, and he an evil man, a diabolical man, but an uh, but a believable man. And as everyone else is shouting and screaming and ranting and raving, Gary just states his point eloquently, and lets it be. And I think that's why it took us a couple weeks to 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 figure it out, really to get it, really to get Gary Hart, because his style was so different from what we had been used to watching as a great promo on the show. That even though it is a great promo, it was not what we expected a great promo to be. And so it took us a while to figure that out. That's on us, I think. Yes, excellent promo. We then had a recap of Barry Windham turning on Lex Luger. And when I say a recap, I mean 16 minutes of the match and the finish and the post-match angle. They just showed the whole damn thing. In case anyone missed last week's show and heard about it and wanted to come in and see what happened, they were going to let you know, here's what happened. Barry Windham turned on Lex Luger and joined the Four Horsemen and tore off the Midnight Riders mask, although that did not make TV. Then we had a Horseman promo in the most 1980s outfits you ever saw, especially Barry, who's always been a good old boy. He wore his wrestling gear and a t-shirt, maybe jeans and a t-shirt and a baseball cap sometimes. Comes out here, he's got designer acid wash jeans, the short sleeve button up shirt, the short, skinny tie, and the white belt. This was peak 1980s douchebag. It was phenomenal. So he cuts a promo on, he still has the Midnight Riders mask. He cuts a promo on the mask, saying, you're not going to hold me back anymore. I'm more talented than you. I'm more talented talented than Luger. Makes his case, and it was a far more exciting promo than most Barry Wynn. Oh, my God. It was like a thousand times better. Mm -hmm. Like, he was a baby face. He had to do the, ah, shucks. Just the friendly... Southern boy, you'd want to take home to mom for your prom date or whatever. This fucking guy was not a baby face. And he's he's boisterous and he's cocky and he's he's like a thousand times better as a heel than he was as a baby face. Tully goes next. He talks about all the feuds and all the wars they've had with Dusty Rhodes over the years. All they've taken from him. They took his belt. They took his money. They took his uh, titles. They took his health, and finally now they've finished him off because Barry has taken his mystique. That's all he had left. And then Arn goes. And this is just fucking amazing. Arn says, Dusty Rhodes, you call yourself the American Dream. Well, what is the American Dream, Dusty, if it's not a man starting from nothing, and through his own hard work and his own had- own sacrifice, making himself a success? So don't be a hypocrite, Dusty Rhodes. And don't begrudge Barry Windham, who started from nothing and now has joined the Horseman and made himself successful. That is such an awesome point. He's exactly right. All Barry Windham has done is done what Dusty Rhodes always bragged about doing. He's made himself successful. He, and sacrificed things to do it. Awesome. That was an awesome promo. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Ivan Koloff versus Larry Davis. I should know, by the way, before we get to this match, that going all the way back to the beginning of the show, this, this, uh, I think it was a J.J. Dillon promo. Where was it? Oh, it was, uh, it was after the clips of the Barry turn. So when J.J. came out and, and basically did his promo explaining the whole turn, how it made sense from the beginning, how everybody should have seen it coming, there were people in the crowd chanting boring. 
And J.J. just ignored them and moved on with his life. So then we get this Ivan Koloff-Larry Davis match. And Ivan Koloff's in there, and he's beating him up. The match goes like, I don't know, two minutes or something like that. And there's more boring chants. And it's kind of like, well, first off, why are you chanting boring at J.J. Dillon? Because if there's one thing that J.J. Dillon is not, it's boring. Second off, it's like these fans just figured out that these are nothing happening, boring squash matches. Like, why are we getting boring chants this week? Where did that come from? Uh, I don't know, but I only heard them during the heel segment, so maybe boring as a way to get under the heel skin. I don't know. Is I'm going to go back and uh, go, when, 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 I, I, I did not watch all 16 minutes of the Barry Windham Lex Luger match again. Perhaps I missed the J.J. Dillon promo there. I'm going to go back and perhaps I, I overskipped. I may have done that. May have overskipped. It was a really good promo. He just. He just basically explained everything that happened and how it made sense and how everyone should have seen it coming and basically trying to paint it as not a complete swerve. And yeah, people chanted boring. It was just, it was bizarre. Was, was this the part where he explained to Barry, I, I had told him at some point when you need him most, Lex Luger won't be there for you? Yes. Yes. I actually remember this promo 30 years later, uh, even though I had skipped it. So I'll have to go back and watch that. So let me talk about Larry Davis for a second. Uh, we have talked about him before because I remember the lightning bolt stretched across his huge belly. But he goes out there in lavender and black, which serves only to emphasize the pale white flab hanging out of his gear. Ivan does the move. A big boss man and Steve Austin and a hundred other guys have done. You drape the guy across the middle rope. You run and you just straddle, the, straddle his back, right? He sets up Larry Davis for this move. But Larry Davis can't even stay on the ropes. So Ivan stomps him and chokes him and beats him some more. And Ivan goes to win with his version of the Russian sickle, which is a diving clothesline off the middle rope. Larry Davis can't even take that. And Ivan's up there and he's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. And Larry won't turn around. And finally Ivan says, fuck. And he jumps off and he clotheslines this guy in the side of the head, takes his head damn off, and then pins him. Now, I have done a lot of worst wrestler of all time of the week on these shows. I'm pretty sure Larry Davis is the first ever worst wrestler of all time of the week of the year. Wow. He was horrendous in this match. Unwatchable. And it's not Ivan's fault. I've seen Ivan in there with a thousand shitty guys. He's never this bad. And actually, he wasn't bad. Here was all Larry Davis. We have the Crockett Cup uh, VHS tape is being plugged. This is the this is the only time the entire show they actually show anything from this tournament or talk about it hardly at all other than the announcement in the beginning that Stan Lex had won. First of all, I couldn't help but note they say these are highlights of the last Crockett Cup. Yeah, they pretty much uh, they, they pretty knew- much flat out announced that they weren't uh, they weren't going to run another one. Yeah, so there's just a bunch of random clips from things. There's the Midnight's cheating to be the sheep herders at one point, which. They never talked about it in the show, but as I recall, the booking for this uh, tournament was so screwed up that the Sheep Herders had to wrestle twice in the second round. Somebody screwed something up, and the Midnight's needed another opponent, so the Sheep Herders had to go back out there. And then Lex and Sting get their trophy and their check, and then neither one of them ever talked about it again. I presume they've got to do more of the uh, follow-up next week. I mean, we, we are talking like, what, what month was this, April? April of 1989. April. So, I mean, they're not that far away from the sales. So, I mean, maybe... Excuse me, 88. 88. So, maybe maybe they're aware that, like, this thing is going to be sold, and God only knows if we'll do one next year. But it was kind of weird that they flat out said this was going to be the last one ever. No, no good explanation for it. I need to know if the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup footage is available anywhere on the WWE Network, like this this one here. I presume it is. I don't know. But... Apparently, it was awesome. The second night, apparently, was great. So, maybe we should watch that one of these days. There are a lot of great tag teams in there, that's for sure. Oh, let's see. Where was I? Uh, David Crockett, talking about, talking about Barry Windham, says he is, quote, wallowing in self-satisfaction. <laughs> Can you I wallow that, in self-satisfaction? <laughs> I don't think it works that way. So, then Tony Schiavone interviews Lex. and this as Lex so is talking, great. As Lex is talking, they show the tape of the finish of the match. And well, before we get to that, so they go to Luger, and Lex Luger got turned on, it's been quite a while now, actually, it's well over a week, and they they alert us that Lex Luger has not seen the tape yet. Lex Luger, he knows what happened, but he hasn't actually seen it. Yes. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to show you that tape, fans, for the second time, but Lex Luger is going to do play-by-play as he allegedly watches this for the first time. 
So Lex, they cut to the part where he tags out and they jump him on the outside, throw him into the guard and he comes up bleeding. He says, I, I was completely out of it. I actually blacked out on the floor, Tony, at one point. And as I, I I've been lacerated. I, been, I love I've that been, word. I had been lacerated. And I came to my senses and I, I, I tried to drag myself to the apron to, to help out in some way, do whatever I could. And the whole time he's talking about this, of course, is this is the segment where Barry's trying to tag out and Lex isn't, isn't there. And finally, Lex drags himself to his feet in the corner and a disgusted Barry Wyndham walks over, forces a tag and slams him into the ring. And Lex says, at this point, I didn't even know this was Barry. I thought this was Tully or Arn or maybe even somebody else slamming me into the ring. And the key was when he got up on the apron, he's like, he's he's half dead. He's slumped over the top rope. He's 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 literally staring at the canvas. And and Barry got over and just slapped his hand. And the story he told actually made sense because when you watched it, he didn't even see who slapped him and slammed him in the ring. Yes. So then he at this point he says, "I was so out of it." I thought the match was over. I thought we had won. I could see Barry's boots in front of me. I pulled myself up, trying to uh, use his body to pull myself up. And then, of course, Barry hit the lariat, and it was lights out. Put my lights out again with that lariat. Yes. He says, Wyndham, you've joined the Four Horsemen. You may think right now that you're among friends, but actually, you have chosen the loneliest path. And I vow to make you regret it if it's the last thing that I ever do in my lifetime. This was awesome. This is great. Speaking of great, the sheep herders. Well, Tommy, this was this was this was good. The greatness <laughs> came later. I would say I, I will disagree. This was great. The sheep herders do great squash matches because they are full of energy. They're always doing something. They're never just lying there. But at the same time. They do take enough time to let these moves sink in, let the guys sell, get their own offense over. This is the the sheep herders do like as far as like uh I don't know how to put this. There's people who are great wrestlers who also do great squash matches. The sheep herders do squash matches better than anything else they do in the ring. The pros are still better, but I would rather watch a sheep herders squash match than a sheep herders competitive match. And that's not there's not a lot of people I would say that about. So Johnny Ace no longer with the sheep herders. He has been replaced by Rip Morgan, who they claim is their nephew. They're doing this match, and they, they they had the audacity and the temerity to actually promote the following match on another show. The Sheep Herders teaming with Rick, Mor- Rick uh, Rip Morgan to take on the babyface trio of Johnny Ace, Kendall Wyndham, and Ricky Santana. Oh, my fucking God. That sounds like torture. Let me tell you who made the wrong, the wrong move. Johnny Ace. Yes. He stepped downward. So they, they do all this stuff. They had the battering ram, they had the gut buster, and they won. The spam slam of the week is Bobby Eaton hitting a running clothesline. Yeah, that's not a slam. I guess he was slammed into the mat as a result of Suppose. the clothesline. That's a, that, that's a stretch, man. Jim Cornette comes out for a promo about the Fantastics stealing the belts. How, he asks, can you stop a match and then start it again? All right, so, so for those who wonder, actually they did show the footage later, but... So when they show the footage, they're they're explaining that they're 40 minutes into the match when this happened. Now, granted, Jim Cornette's a heel and he lies. It was not actually 40 minutes into the match when all of this happened and they were showing us, but the entire match was, in fact, 40 minutes long. So when they went to the footage, they were probably about 30 minutes into the match, which was still a goddamn long time. And the story was that Fulton got dropped neck first over the barricade outside, practically killed, and the heels just beat the shit out of him. They beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him. They killed him forever. And the ref, uh, what the, who the hell was that ref? Was it uh, Pee Wee Anderson? I think it was Pee Wee Anderson. The ref is, is checking on him, and they finally get to the big spot where the ref sends the heels back to their corner. And, and waves his hands. Yep, he's he's getting ready to end this match. Mm. And instead, Tommy Rogers jumps in, and he's begging him not to stop it. And Fulton, through, through his, his blood and his tears, is, is begging the referee not to stop it. And so, in fact, the referee decides, fuck, I'm not going to stop it. And he lets the match continue. And in the middle of this schmoz, Fulton goes up top, drop kicks Eaton, he falls into a schoolboy, he gets pinned. Eaton is not the legal man, 
which is just the worst way to lose a tag match, I might add. He is not the legal man. Cornette's freaking out that he's not the legal man. Stan Lane is. It's one of those things where they actually gave the babyfaces a win, but it's Jim Crockett Promotions. There are just so many fuck finishes all the time. They couldn't even just let the Fantastics beat the Midnight Express. They, like, had to do the thing where, you know, the ref almost stopped it, but didn't. He actually almost waved it off, but didn't. And then they didn't even pin the legal man. So they they gave it out for the heels for some reason. And, I don't know, just kind of, like, put a damper on the whole title win of the, the Fantastics. Okay, all of that is fair and accurate, but I think you're glossing over a lot of... Really enjoyable details. First, Cornette comes out. He makes his claim. He demands they show the tape. Crockett says, we'll show the tape after this ID break. And Cornette rants, everyone knows what station they're watching. There is a five-second graphic to say you're watching the Superstation on TBS. Then they go to the tape. When Bobby Fulton gets knocked outside, he gets thrown outside, and and, and Stan kind of catches him and drops him across the guardrail. Although, as Cornette says in commentary, what happened was Fulton was just so clumsy, he just fell out of the ring and went headfirst into the, into the guardrail. Cornette hits a very loud racket shot to the back. He claims this is doctored video. Fulton threw a punch at him. Cornette was just trying to defend himself. And then the key to all this is Bobby Fulton is, in fact, in the ring, in the corner, bloody. He can't stand on his own. He's just leaning against the turnbuckles, and he is, as Cornette said, unable to defend himself. This should have been stopped. This absolutely should have been stopped in any in any fair, just, sane world. And in fact, if you you can't pull a guy off and then say the match is not canceled, the match is is still going. That makes no sense. The Midnight Express were totally screwed. Cornette's right about all of this. The, the illegal man was pinned. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So we go back to the studio. And Cornette says, we were one week short of being U.S. Tag Team Champions for one year. Mama Cornette was going to throw us a big anniversary party. But I tell you what. Next week, the NWA is going to correct this decision. They're going to give us back the U.S. Tag Team titles. We're going to throw a celebration then. And that's going to be the biggest party you've ever seen. And all I could, the only other thing I had to add was, as I wrote, I've never seen a man sweat during a promo like this. And I stopped and said, well, there was Lex Luger all the time. I was going to say. Yeah. Plenty of men. I, I, I've sweat like that recapping these shows. No, he was sweating, dude. Yes. Well, he did, yes. He claimed that next week they're going to personally hand the titles back to the Midnight Express. And I don't want to, I don't want to give any spoilers here, but they're not going to hand them back. I hope Jim Cornette's celebration that he had planned involves a cake. Of course it will. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin versus Alan Martin. And the only thing of note in this match is the, the announcers are talking about the U.S. title tournament in Houston. They say the Midnight Rider is one of the men in the tournament, but at the same time, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes will be there as a guest of the promoter Paul Bosch. And if it's really Dusty Rhodes under that hood, as the Four Horsemen claim, how could he possibly be in the tournament and be a special guest? So Jimmy wins the brain buster. What I got out of this was, are we sure that Alan Martin is not George South? They had the same giant fluffy mullet. I guess I'm not. Although George South's mullet was like, it was incredible. The last two or three weeks of George's ultra dry, unconditioned mullet. And it's like it, poofed out. It's not just yeah, like it's, it's dry. It's, it's like, I mean, know. literally it's a fire hazard. <laughs> it's, it's like a troll doll hair, but upside down. It looks, looks like funny. a tumbleweed on his head. Yes, yes. Not safe to be around him. So Garvin gets a promo. He says, you know what Lex Luger did, or what Barry Windham did to Lex Luger was disgusting. Pretty low life, he says. Pretty low but, life, in fact. But everybody's got their own problems. Kevin Sullivan tried to kidnap his squeeze. He tried to seriously injure Ronnie Garvin. Stuff like that makes a man want to go out and hide in the woods and forget about this trash. Everything Sullivan said was a lie. This is my woman. She's always been my woman. And I got some film to show you people some sick individuals. This so we film. Clips. <laughs> we talked about this fucking Prince of Darkness death match. I am so happy we didn't watch this. It was a blindfold match. And basically, like, what you saw, like, the, the 30 seconds that you saw on this was, like, the match. It was, like, seven minutes of them wandering around. Mm-hmm. Not touching each other. Yeah. And then, like, finally at the very end, it was just, you know, Garvin rolled him up and pinned him. 
This Hell of a was, death match. This was a death match. So they, they roll him up, they pin him, and I'd forgotten about the post-match. As, as, as goofy as the match itself was, the heels go after Garvin because he still has a damn blindfold on. I don't know why it took so long to get his blindfold off. Sullivan takes his blindfold off. They're beating the hell out of him. Ronnie Garvin comes out to make the save. The varsity club attacks him. Sullivan then pulls out what they describe as the golden spike. Mm-hmm. It looks like a roll of athletic tape around a carrot. <laughs> it's white. He lifts this up into the air, and, and they claim that he plunged it into Garvin's heart. Okay? Yes! Not his chest. No. No. He plunged this Golden carrot spike. <laughs> into his heart. And Ronnie Garvin goes down, and literally they played this up as like a major, serious, big-time injury angle. He'd been murdered by Kevin Sullivan and the Golden Spike. This was so wacky. And they drag Precious into the ring, but before it can go any farther, a bunch of baby faces come out and clean house. Literally, like this is the this is the the NW Jim Crockett Promotions, the NWA. They've got Ric Flair. And the horsemen, and they've got their, their, you know, they, they win their money, and they drive their cars, and they wrestle, and it's like a serious, sports-oriented promotion, and here's this fucking guy that's always going to Singapore, and he's got a golden spike, and he worships the devil, and he's corrupted these two youngsters, and it's just preposterous. There is a lot of... Uh... Yeah, there's a lot of clashing <laughs> in the tone of some of these characters and some of these acts on the show, that's for sure. So the Varsity Club do a squash match against Joe Cruz and Andrew Bellamy. I suppose I didn't need to tell you that that was a squash match. Uh, Jim Simon- Ross says, in regards to the, the Varsity Club, and I quote, They spend a lot of time in the gymnasium and the study hall. <laughs> he did say that. If I ever appear on JR's podcast again, I am begging he will introduce me in the same fashion. So Steiner hits a belly to belly, and Rotunda hits a butterfly suplex, and they win. Then we get a varsity club promo. First of all, Kevin Sullivan says, Barry Windham chose the right path. But there's something more important going on. And then he goes way out beyond left field, telling a story about wolves attacking a jackal, the graphic, gory details of what the wolves do to this jackal. Talking yeah. about in- intestines. Another and heart. story about the time that he was in Bangkok and there were yes. Asians gambling on animals. Yes. Like, what the fuck is he talking about? Well, the moral of the story was even though this jackal's guts were hanging out, it made a comeback and it killed the four wolves. He said this is a lesson to the four horsemen. The midnight rider could still finish them all. He says, look. No one thought anyone could get rid of Ronnie Garvin. We got rid of Ronnie Garvin. We'll get rid of the Midnight Rider, too, if you give us a chance. And as for Patty, he says, Jimmy, if you think I'm lying, let me ask you this. When you got home from the gym and she slammed down the telephone and you said, who was that? And she said it was a friend. Ask her if it was a friend named Kevin. Hmm. Sting versus Steve Atkinson. Sting wins with the Scorpion in 30 seconds. Does a promo with David. What's funny about this? I, I thought about this when I was watching the Sting match. These shows are like very reminiscent, hear me out, of a Vince Russo edition of Raw. It's a bunch of nothing happening 30 second matches that are largely meaningless. And then everything else is what they concentrate on. But the difference is. The Russo Raws, like the everything else was shit. Whereas in the NWA, the everything else was like awesome promos, recaps of awesome angles. It's just, it, it, it's similar. Logical, but believable it's story exact, But it's yes. totally different. But it is the same thing. Like there's, there's no emphasis on the wrestling on this show. Well, of course not. It's all squash matches. So maybe once every three or four months, there'll be a, a, a reasonable main event. But yes, it's, it's essentially. I mean, a squash match is not really, I mean, a squash match is basically just a live highlight reel. Sometimes longer, but the, the point of a squash match is not, to, is not to do good wrestling. 
is to show off the talents of one particular combatant or team, what have you. So Sting does this promo, and David Crockett goes to interview me. He says, boy, the way you fly across that ring, it's like you got wings. And I don't know if Sting knew Crockett was going to ask him this specific question, but boy, did he pick up that baton and run with it. I may have wings. I also have brains, unlike Barry Windham. He's a little whacked out these days. Now, I'm a little whacked out, too, but I always got a straight path. I always got a goal in mind. Barry Windham reminds me of one of those bum types from Venice Beach, where I come from. And then he does his impression of a stoner, implying that Barry Windham is high on marijuana. It's totally bizarre, because, like, he starts doing this promo, and as you noted, he first says that Barry Windham is whacked. Then he realizes, fuck, I'm whacked. Sting. <laughs> so he goes, I'm whacked too, but I admit it. <laughs> then he starts burying California surfers, yes. which is his gimmick that he's a California surfer. <laughs> it's just the weirdest fucking promo. And he got away with it because he's Sting. Because he's fucking Sting. He says, you, uh, you like this sign? He holds up the four fingers. He says, I think this is the sign of deadly squat. And he stops, and he looks at the camera, and he just shouts, Think about it, Wyndham! Had a Midnight Rider promo. Shortened to the point. Tells Barry Wyndham, Go ahead, go sow your wild oats, Barry Wyndham. But you'd better come to your senses before you make Dusty Rhodes angry. You better come to your senses before you make me come and get you. By God, Barry Wyndham, don't make me do it! So... Shall I do the spoiler now, or should we just wait till next week? Why don't you do the spoiler now? I'll do it now. Yeah. Yeah. It's over. This is the end of the Midnight Rider. Oh. Literally, next week, they drop it dead. Oh. And Dusty just gets reinstated. I I guess they had this big, long plan, like this several-month-long plan, and they were going around the loop or whatever, and it just, they felt it wasn't getting over. Okay. And so next week, they just pulled the damn plug. That's it. Hey, if something's not working, it's okay to quit. Well, in general, you're right, but, like, it wasn't flopping that bad. I see. And there were a lot of other reasons that this this place was flopping. That's and, also true. And, I mean, for crying out loud, like, it's one thing to drop something that's not working, but, like, this was the centerpiece of this promotion for, like, weeks now. It was all built around Dusty and the Midnight Rider. The next week, they just drop it. Nikita Koloff versus Trent Knight. Nikita very quickly wins with a sickle. Jim Ross on commentary notes, hey, a lot of you fans have been commenting and writing that Nikita looks smaller. That's only because of his new diet and training regimen. Oh. He's got to do long matches with Ric Flair. He's still as strong as he's ever been. He didn't have to do that before. He's carrying less weight. He's better suited for these marathon matches. Huh. So Nikita cuts a promo about his match with Flair, the Crockett Cup. Says it was his night. Flair knew it was his night, and so Flair took the coward's way out. Got himself DQ'd. And then he moves on to Barry Windham. Said he has stood by Barry Windham's side, but he knows from the bottom of his heart, Barry Windham will know that he made the wrong decision. Powers of Pain versus Jerry Price and Keith Steinborn. It was long. It was boring. The Powers won with a heart attack. So the match starts, and Jim Ross is talking about the Powers of Pain. And he says... I wouldn't face them with a loaded gun. And I thought, it's very dramatic, probably a little bit over dramatic. But then the match starts, and the warlord grabs this Jerry Price fella, and he lifts him up, and he just fucking throws him neck first into the middle rope. And I'm not talking like, you know, where you neck the guy in the rope, and it is his armpits actually go over the rope, and so he basically is taking it with his chest, and then he sells his neck. He fucking threw him neck first into that middle rope. Like, he could have killed this guy. And just brutal. And they hit the heart attack finish, and that was the end of that. That was scary. Brian, we'd like to talk about the sheep herders promo. These damn sheep herders come out, and they've got their new man, Rip Morgan. And all we knew was at the beginning of the show, they announced that they were now their cousin, Rip Morgan, I believe they called him. Was it cousin? What was it, their cousin? Uh, nephew, cousin? Nephew, something like that. They call each other cousin, so, yeah. Yeah, so all we know is that he's out there now. Their nephew, Rip Morgan, I apologize. Their nephew, Rip Morgan. So all we know is that they've they've replaced Johnny Ace, and, and they never explain why during that segment. 
So they come out here, and the sheep herders cut a promo, and it's uh, Butch. He says, this Johnny Ace, he's a bloody traitor. To the sheep herders and to New Zealand, we thought we could take a yank and turn him into a man. We thought there was a chance we could do it with Johnny Ace because he was the best of the best. But he turned out like the rest of you yanks. He turned out he had a yellow streak down him. He couldn't get rid of his USA patriotism. We couldn't drain the Yankee blood out of his veins. I watched this four straight times. I was late to do this show because I watched this promo over and over and over again. These, it's not even the, the, the sheep herders. It's Butch. He's one of the best promos. He's so great. I loved this. And then they announced that they switched to Rip Morgan, a man they could depend on. They switched to Rip Morgan. He was the only man in New Zealand who could rip the head off a wild, bloody boar. That's right. Also, at some point in here, I believe Butch used the word patriotism. Yeah, patriotism. Yes, yes. So, so they've got Rip Morgan. They've just been in the Crockett Cup, and they suddenly announce... We are going to win the six-man tag team title belts, which are currently held by the Powers of Pain and Ivan Koloff. And they also say they're going to take the mask off the Midnight Rider. And in your main event, Rip Morgan in his on-screen wrestling debut versus Ryan Wagner. Morgan does the very worst, as Ross called it, New Zealand war haka of all time. Did a match. He looked fine. He won with a diving forearm to the neck. Yeah, it was a fun little squash, but I mean, it was, it was nothing like, uh, nothing groundbreaking or earth shattering or anything of that nature. But hey, I like him a lot more than this goofy Johnny Ace fellow that they have. He's so much better than Johnny Ace. Yeah. Although Johnny Ace's horribleness is actually part of the charm. Yes, he was much wackier than Rip Morgan. Yes. Which yes. is saying something. Yes. Morgan fits in better with the sheep herders, but the problem is he fits in better with the sheep herders. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a show. It was a hell of a show. I loved this show. I don't know if I was just in a good mood or what, but I thought this show was awesome. I'm going back over. I, did, I was not, except for that Sheep Herders promo, I was not in a great mood about it. But going back over, there's a lot of good stuff on this show. Yeah, there was there was uh, not a lot of great wrestling, but I guess but A we, lot of great stuff. We did, see, we did see a little great wrestling from elsewhere. Like, we saw the clips of the tag title change, and they showed the angle again, the, the Wyndham turn, which is a classic. We got some great promos. A lot of good stuff here, so this show highly recommended. And I believe the last time you left.